Good evening, y'all. Welcome back to another Electronics Bash Sunday night. Fundamentals of Arduino stream. Already seeing some familiar faces out there. Hi, Chris. Hi, Nate. Good to see you again on what is at least here in Chicago a very warm and muggy uh, summer night and probably stormy at some point. So at some point this evening, you may hear the thunder outside or you will at the very least hear my my dog having feelings about the thunder. Uh, it's gonna be uh, gonna be a bit of an adventure of an evening, but you know we'll see we'll see how we do. Um, we've already given our, our lovely dog Winnie her 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 little doggy chill pills. Oh no, my my timer has stopped. I think I I went to start it just to like right in a, a perfect time as we started here, and I think I closed the app. So that's how things are going. Um, I am excited for this week, y'all. I think it's gonna be really fun. After spending uh, the last three weeks on what I think you will all agree. Um, was a bit of a nerd deep dive into interrupts and registers and timer registers. Um, I thought it would be fun to take a slightly more, take a week where the content is a little bit more snackable um, and just look at like where you get interesting electronic parts in the world these days. Um, like all of these various Arduinos and modules and things that we've been playing with for the past the past 18 weeks, which is pretty wild. Um, where can you find them? Where can you get them? And what are the things that are out there? Um, I think will be really fun and I think will be a really uh, useful, you know, sort of nice transition into next week uh, when we start talking about Raspberry Pi stuff. Um, because, you know, even if you have had sources for all the Arduino-y things so far, um, Raspberry Pi is going to start coming down the pipe. So just a little recap. for We, we shared this at the end of... Uh, <laughs> Chris, you are in fine fettle tonight. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned at the end of last week, I think next week we're going to talk a little about the Raspberry Pi um, and what it is and what you can do with it and why you'd want to use it versus Arduino. You know, a lot of the time I hear people throwing out things like, you know, oh, I'm going to I'm going to throw a Raspberry Pi at this project or I'm going to throw uh, an Arduino at this project. You know, you hear them mentioned sort of in the same breath a lot. Um, and I'd be, I think it'd be a fun synergy to talk about them both. Um, and what one is good at, what the other is good at, what you can use each of them for. Um, we'll also use that sort of as a jumping off point to, to talk. And this won't, this won't be next week. This will be further down the road. Um, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about programming in a Raspberry Pi-like environment. We're going to talk about Python and CircuitPython. Um, and one thing I mentioned last week, um, part of the reason I sort of prefaced like that Raspberry Pi is coming down the pipe is if you want to get yourself one, if you don't already have one to play with, um, they're really not expensive. Mine is actually hooked up to my 3D printer behind me here. Um, but here's a little a little Raspberry Pi 0W. Oh, yeah, I should explain what's going on with this camera. Um Anyway, any of the Raspberry Pis will do. They are not natively purple. So here's what's going on. It's been a bit of an exciting week, um, technologically speaking, setting up for this stream. So this is the DSLR camera that I use, or I guess it's a mirrorless camera that I used to do all like the top down table shots for these uh, these demos. And I can hear you wondering, well, if the if the camera is here, how are you getting this shot on the table? Well, I'm having I'm having lens issues. Um, these kit lenses, these OSS lenses that come with the camera are sort of known for, for breaking. Um, and specifically, they have this little plastic ring that is sort of has all the, it's basically the the midpoint of the lens where everything else attaches. And this is the broken one that I pulled out and replaced it with a, a unbroken one and something is still not right. So this camera, though it, it is functional, it doesn't focus, which makes it not, oops, I've turned it on there. Um, makes it not a great camera for doing anything with uh, that's, you know, need to actually see. So I'm actually using my phone as a camera through a lightning to HDMI adapter into a cam link into the computer. And it's, it, it's not an official Apple product. It's a little sort of off brandy one. It does this weird thing. Um, with the various hues of various things. So I did some hue correction. I, I shifted all the hues over so that like skin tone looks, I mean, it looks looks like I got some jaundice, but it looks okay. Um, but uh, for some reason, also like anything in like the red pinkish part of the spectrum. So this, here, I'll show you. This is the real color of this board. This is a red PCB. This is an LCD module we'll look at in a little bit. On this camera, it looks close. It's orangey. It's, it's pretty good. But things in the green or blue part of the spectrum. So I have a blue circuit board and a green, a blue large and a green small of things. If I look at them under the camera, they become a green large and a blue small. Like the hues are sort of mirrored across the red axis, if you will. Um, so not all the colors of the thing on this will be correct, but that's for the for the purposes of what we're looking at tonight, it's not really gonna gonna matter too much. Um, but just if it really does matter, I'll show you in this camera. Um, yeah, weird, right, Travis? Hi, Travis. Um, I I think there's something going on. Like this is is in a different color space than 
what the cam link is expecting or it's doing something janky. Um, I, I'm sure there's a way to fix it. It's something I just couldn't figure out how to fix in like the 10 minutes that I cared. So this is good enough for now. I've got a replacement lens on order. So next week, I think we'll be back to, to real reality. Or maybe we'll just keep playing with fun effects. But in any case, that, that's what we've got going on. So if it seems like I'm, you know, should get more vitamin C, it's just a, you know, it's a trick of the camera. Um, hey, Lee, how are you doing? Oh, real quick before we dive in, just that usual weekly question. What is everybody drinking? And again, no pressure to drink alcohol. I know it's not everybody's bag. It's my bag on a Sunday night, and I am drinking a kind of fascinating beer. This is a Rico and Sunny milkshake IPA with strawberry uh, from Solemn Oath Brewery out in uh, Naperville here in the suburbs. Um, it's not... So milkshake IPA... Um, is like, I, I don't, it's, I don't know what it means. It just tastes like a fruity IPA. I don't know where the milkshake part comes from. Um, it's very good. It's really my speed. Um, did I, have I drunk in this one before? I'm not actually sure. I should check the list that Lee and Travis made for me. I don't think I've done this one on stream before. Um, oh, Chris, that's a good thought. There's lactose in it. That would make some sense. Well, I'll have a sip of mine as you have a sip of yours and, uh, and then we'll dive into tonight. Yeah, that's good. It's pretty tasty. It's a little, it's a little extra strawberry. They make a pina colada milkshake IPA, um, which is, uh, it's a little strange. Um, but it's like it's very lightly coconutty. So if that's your bag. Um, that's really tasty. We swung by the Solemn Oath Brewery when we were staying out in the suburbs Fourth of July and scooped up a couple four packs. And this is the last of that. So that'll be a fun way to to finish things off. It's a new beer. <laughs> Travis has become our our beer meister or our. Uh, Travis, you can be our kegmeister. Um, and if Michael Glass is in the chat tonight, he can tell us. Uh, he can tell us if he wants to the uh, the keg master story told. But that's his prerogative. Um, so what are we talking about tonight? So I, I sort of got off on a little bit of a tangent. Right, like the last two weeks have been um, have been pretty dense. Right, like it's been. I I love the dense nerdy stuff. Oh, also let me know if the audio is weird. I know it sometimes is. I'm probably a little bit over enthusiastic there. Um, Last three weeks have been a little bit, uh, a little bit deep, a little bit intense. We did some binary, we did some logic, we did some interrupts and timers. Super, super fun. I love that stuff. But it seemed like it'd be a nice week to like take a little bit of a more, you know, a little more of a jaunt of an evening and just look at some interesting modules and tools and various suppliers and places to get them. So I pulled a bunch of stuff out of my work box. I've got a bunch of websites bookmarked, um, and you're probably gonna get a bunch of tummy cam tonight as I'm like, oh, so you. What you don't see is, you know, I had the shelves behind me, but most of my shelving is arrayed all all right behind the camera here. So I'm like, if I think of a thing we should take a look at, I'm just going to grab it and we'll have a little peek. I also like am for sure going to miss suppliers that y'all know and love or have looked at. Or if you're like, oh, where would you find something like this? Would love to hear about it tonight. Um, I believe it is not possible to put links directly in the chat. I think that's like an anti-spam feature. So what I'm going to try is there is... Um, a Google form linked in the description of this video. So if you're like, if I'm like, hey, this is the best, you know, power supply website that I know, and you're, you know, Chris is like, I know a better one. You, I think you can drop a link in that Google form and it will show up for me in a little spreadsheet. Um, I, it probably won't automatically. So you might have to like ping the chat and be like, hey, Jeff, check the thing. Um, <laughs> tell no tales. All right. That's the way we will share, share no more secrets of Kegmeister's past. But, um, but if you want to share a link tonight, you're like, Hey, here's a super cool supplier that you haven't talked about. Put it in that Google form and we'll uh, honestly, we'll see if it works. I set it up literally 10 minutes ago when I realized you couldn't put links and things. Um, so it'll be good. And, and like I say, also anything you're like, Hey, where would I find something like this? We'll see if I know. And if I don't, I, between the, the faces and voices I'm seeing in the chat tonight, I'm sure somebody does. So we'll just have a good old time. I think I have a grand total of four slides tonight. So if the last few weeks have been slide heavy, you are in for a treat this evening. Let's, um, oh yes, Chris, we're set up for, we're set up for live chat. I have the mouse configured correctly. I've turned off like nighttime color correction. I wouldn't say if I remembered everything, but we're, we're doing okay so far. Let's knock out a couple of these slides right quick here, huh? Um, things we're going to talk about this week. Um, we're going to talk about hobbyist suppliers, places where you would get things like, um, you know, Arduinos and servo motors and hobbyist kits and all sorts of things. Um, and we're spending, we're spending like a big chunk of our evening in that because that's kind of the world of making things that we're living in these days, right? Um, we're talking about overseas internet suppliers. So uh, places like AliExpress and various things coming from China, basically, um, that have things for super cheap if you're willing to wait for them. Um, we're going to talk about a category that I think of as warehouse suppliers people who just have 
interesting parts and components. They're not really targeting them toward anyone specific. They just bought a crate of, you know, hobby stepper motors 10 years ago, and they're selling to them to you for a buck a piece. Um, also, usually with slow shipping. Um, we'll talk a little bit about professional hardware suppliers. Like if you wanted to buy specifically, you know, um, 800 one watt, 710 ohm uh, through hole resistors, um, and you wanted to be them to be of some quality, we'll look at some online vendors where you could get like, you know, actual sort of electronic parts and chips and ICs and things like that. And then we'll look, we'll sort of wrap up by looking at professional hardware suppliers where you could get like things like extruded aluminum and rods and bolts and enclosures and things like that. You could get them shipped to you. And we'll probably, honestly, like we'll probably find a few more things along the way. This is just kind of like the rough brain dump that I did, like things that I, um, that I, I think I would use. Um, and as I'm, I'm real quick, I'm going to reset my, my stream controller here. Oh, so part of, part of the chicanery of tonight, um, that's going on is because I'm using my phone as the camera, um, for this evening here, I'll bring you over here because I'm using my phone as the camera, um, for my desk, I am using my iPad to control the stream scenes. And because I'm using my phone, I had to take the phone holder down, which was serving as the lighting holder for an overhead light that I've got, um, which meant that I had to put my camera holder. It's been a whole thing. I've also switched to a different like ethernet uh, line and I should, actually, I should see how that's, how that's looking. Um, if, if you start seeing stuttering, let me know. Um, We'll see if that holds up. I'm using, I'm using a, a new line that doesn't require me to drag an ethernet cable across the hallway of my house anymore, which I think is a plus. Um, so we'll see if that holds up. And if it doesn't, I st actually still have that cable run across the hallway of my house so that I can grab it and plug it in if things go sideways. So anyway, as usual, let me know if things go wrong and we'll just fix them and it'll be great. All right. Um, where to start? Let us here. I will hold on to this responses spreadsheet. So this is if you go to the link in the description, um, this is the like form that you get. Um, Let's see here. So you can like share a link and post it to a thing and then I can get it and look at it um, and see what links you've sent me if you want to. Um, uh, getting some lag. Wonder if it was just you. Yeah, I had I what I noticed on the on the stream here is I had a little bit of um, uh, uh, my my rate dropped off for a couple seconds there to like two kilobits a second and then it came back up. So I'm not sure what that's about. Um, if it keeps happening, do flag me and I'll, I'll switch back to the old solution and we'll troubleshoot later. Um. So let's start by looking at some interesting things. Here, we can take the table away for now. Um, let's look at some, oops, <laughs> let's open 17 billion tabs. That's gonna be kind of the story of tonight. Um, let's open these in a new window so we can see them. So where I wanna start tonight um, is uh, what I think of as like hobbyist suppliers. And these sort of run the gamut of how much um, work they're putting into the hobby ecosystem. But a lot of these suppliers, especially the first two, one of the nice things about them is they're building products and kits and supplies for for hobbyists, right? For people who want to buy one of a thing and have it work and learn how to use it and try something new. Um, and that's really cool. And a lot of their products come with instructional materials, user guides, code libraries um, that makes them really easy to use. So the two I want to start with just to get right, get to get right to it after 15 minutes um, are Adafruit and SparkFun. Um, they have been around for the better part of 15 years now, both of them. They're both really useful websites. You may have run across them before. Um, oh, I should say all of the all of the things that I thought to uh, that I've thought of now, let alone what we're gonna you know, like pull up during the course of the night, there is a link in the description of this video and in the end of the slides to the electronics page page electronics bash page on my website that has all of these links in it. I literally just data dumped all of my bookmarks in the website, um, so like all of these links are there for you to play along with tonight or look back on in the future. You know, so you don't have to like figure out how Adafruit is spelled. It's a d a f r u i t dot com for what it's worth. But there's also a link on the website you can just go click it um so adafruit is super super cool um it's was uh started by a woman called limor freed in her college dorm room back in the day um just making and selling little kits and now it's like a hundred person company based out of manhattan and they sell all kinds of useful things um and a fair amount of this like hobbyist de digging around part of this evening will be looking at adafruit so we'll put a little pin in that um the other one is spark fun um, they also make lots of interesting kits and boards and things, and we're going to get into their product a little bit deeper. I just want to give you, like, the broad overview of hobbyist suppliers, and then I want to dig deeper into some of the cool product categories, especially that Adafruit and SparkFun have, because they're really cool. 
Um, a few other suppliers to touch on before we, we go digging into those product lines. Um, Evil Mad Scientist is a really cool uh, supplier. They are based out of Sunnyvale, which is where uh, I am originally from. I've actually been to and visited their, their uh, it's not really a, it's kind of a retail location. It's just sort of their, their warehouse shop. Um, but I just, I, they showed up on a Google map search while I was visiting uh, my folks out there at one point and I swung by and just said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not really here to buy anything. I'm, I'm just kind of curious. I buy your LEDs all the time. They said, oh, sure. Come on back. See what our, our shop looks like. And they were really super nice. Um, really cool suppliers. Um, we might as well get into a couple of their products because we're not as likely to come back here. Um, they make a really cool, so Palmer, I don't know if Palmer's with us tonight, but he had asked at one point about uh, the 555 timer um, that you sort of hear as like a, you know, a common chip you would use to do timing applications. But one of the things that um, Evil Mad Scientist did at one point is make what they call a, a discrete 555 timer. So inside this chip, you know, inside a 555 chip, uh, which is a normal, you know, little eight pin chip, um, it basically is the equivalent of about 20 transistors. So what they said is, well, we'll sell you a version that is 20 transistors on a big circuit board. You know, this thing is the size of your hand with all the individual transistors on there. And then if you wanted to go in with an oscilloscope or a multimeter and probe around and see how the thing was actually working, you sort of have like a life, you know, a bigger than life size version to experiment with. So that's one of the cool things they do. Um, the other product of theirs that's really taken off is the Axie Draw, which is a uh, a 3D, I guess it's a 2D printer. It's a pen plotter. Um, and it's a sort of a, a two axis kit that you can use to, you know, insert your pens or, or some ones that they sell into a little two axis drawing system um, and make uh, interesting generative art or plot your plots or various things. Um, uh, so they they have two two models that actually draw many and the full size and they've really they've really taken off in sort of like the hobbyist like generative art scene in the past few years. In fact, I let's just just because this is going to be the kind of night it is. Um, I guess it is three axis, Chris, because it's going to be um, I guess we lifting the pen up at some point. Um, but if we search Twitter for Axi Draw, let's see what we turn up with. Yeah, so people make all kinds of interesting art with this stuff. Um, like, you know, doing various pen swaps, um, doing art, so sort of like this sort of text that's shaded in a specific way by varying the pressure, um, you know, doing, that's very loud in my ears, but doing, you know, this kind of generative geometric art, super, super cool kit. Um, so yeah, go and, go and dig around an Axie Draw Twitter at some point. You, know, you won't, you won't regret it. I actually, I follow the Axie Draw hashtag just because it's, it's neat and it's nerdy. Um, so Evil Mad Science is super cool. They're also one of my big sources for um, component LEDs. Let's see if I can find that. Axi draw, axi draw, axi draw. Disintegrated circuits, um, various soldering kits of interesting kinds. Um, let's see, LED menorah kits. They have all kinds of interactive LED panels. Let's see, here we go. Um, I've, I've ordered a, a bunch of discrete LEDs from Evil Mad Scientist over time. Um, they break them down by color. You can get these matrix displays. Um, you know, if you wanted specifically, if you're trying to find like a warm white LED that is, you know, 10 millimeters and flickles, flickers by itself like a candle or a little tiny three, three millimeter LED um, that's got a diffused or a clear lens. Like they have a really nice breakdown of all this stuff. So Evil Mad Scientist is a, a super cool vendor and they're great people. So worth looking, looking at. I'm a, I was going to say, I, of course, you probably have, um, probably have guessed I'm not sponsored by any of these folks. So like anyone that I'm like, they're great, use them. It's because they're great and I have used their products and they they seem to be good people. Um, so none of, none of this is like sponsored or anything weird like that. Just, I don't, do I have to say that on the internet these days? I don't know. It's going to be fine. Um, let's see here. Let's do that. Um, next vendor to, to throw at you is Pololu. Um, they've been around for ages. Pololu, it focuses on robotics parts. They fall somewhere between like the hobbyist and the like scientific lab supplier spectrum of things. So you can absolutely get, you know, a little, just to click on something on the homepage here, like a little kit that has, you know, a, a controller and a couple of wheels and balances and is a robot or has a gripper motor or various things. Um, but you can also get like a pretty serious set of, you know, motors and linear actuators to do 
sort of semi-industrial automation or like laboratory automation, which is pretty cool. Um, so they are, they're a great source. They're really reliable. Um, I have a lot of, of, know a lot of folks who source like all of their motor drivers and motors from Pololu um, because they're, they're sort of known from coming from good sources and they're going to be high quality and not give up on you, which is pretty cool. Um, they also have some of their own line of like various programmable boards and things. I haven't used those as much, but it might be fun to, to play around with. But really where they make their bread and butter is like in all of their motors and their motor related products. Like here's a whole family of brushed motor drivers of various specs and capacities, various voltage ranges. So um, that's kind of where they, they make their home. Um, so pull a loop for robotic stuff. Um, Arduino, the Arduino corporation organization. Um, oh, you know what I have to do is restart my Bonjour service again. Um, the Arduino organization has their own web store. Oh, hi, Palmer. Let me switch back over to you here. Hi, how are you? Palmer, you were kind of the inspiration, actually, a little bit for what we're doing this evening, which is like just we, uh, some number of weeks ago, and I forget what time it was, we had like pulled a shield, an Arduino shield out of a box. I was like, here's a thing. And you were like, I actually would love to know more about shields. And that got me thinking like we could do a whole night just like talking about interesting kits and bits and bobs. Um, and so that's kind of what we're doing tonight. So we're kind of breezing through the hobbyist sort of uh, suppliers now, and then we're going to dig into their catalogs a little bit. Um, oh, Chris also points out buck converters from Pololu is great. I get my buck converters for, for cheapsies from, from China, um, but for sourcing them from a reputable source, especially for the kind of like motor driven stuff that I know Chris is doing is probably a good idea. Let me reset this one more time. The stream controller on my iPad is having a little bit of trouble. So if you see me fiddling with, you know, resetting the task manager at some point, I did just the ongoing saga of crazy colors and, and things tonight. Um, where were we? Oh, so the Ar Arduino itself, like the Arduino Corporation has a web store. So if you go to their, you know, arduino.cc and click on store, um, they will sell you their various boards and things. I have never ordered directly from them, but you certainly can. Um, some of the boards that are not super common anywhere else are some of the brand new official Arduino models show up first here. So like, for example, um, here is the Arduino Nano IoT or one of them, um, which has, I don't know, the 33 has probably Bluetooth um, and Wi-Fi built right in. They have a, a number of models of these um, that have come out recently. Yeah, so Bluetooth, low energy, uh, looks like this one is just BLE um, and maybe Wi-Fi as well. Um, so you can order from here. There's a lot of also products that compete with these from Adafruit and SparkFun. Um, our, the Arduino Corporation tends to be, a, I would say, a little bit behind the game in terms of pushing out new functionalities like Wi-Fi and, and Bluetooth Low Energy to their boards. Um, but they are the official Arduino supplier. So that's an option if you want to go shop for them. Um... Let's see, who else we got in here? Oh, a couple of random ones. So uh, Seed Studio, S-E-E-E-D, three E's in there, um, makes some really interesting lines of um, of a lot of things. Um, they make some various Arduino compatible boards, like this little tiny one that's, you know, just a little bit bigger than the uh, the USB-C connector there, which is kind of fun. Um, that's the the Zhao, the Arduino, the Seedwino Zhao. Um they make a, a whole bunch of different things. Um, a lot of various kits, like they're, you know, will supply various things, but they also have like, like this laser scanner module. Um, you know, it's $250, but like if you wanted to like get into very basic LiDAR, here's a cool module to go to. Um, so I haven't ordered that much from Seed. I mostly, I, I might necessarily line up with the kind of things I'm interested in. Um, all of these suppliers, I will say, will have things like Arduino Unos and Raspberry Pis and various other single board computers. And a lot of them will have accessories as well. So like, you know, let's go to the Arduino section here and come down to, uh, I don't know, cases um, or cables and we'll see or kind of a formatting error is what we'll see first, I guess. But you can buy a USB mini cable, right? Or you could buy, you know, we could go to, let's see what, what shields we have available, what display shields we've got. A little bit weird to render, but then we've got some OLED shields and various things. So all these will sort of have an assortment of sort of basic parts. And we'll go into those more in just a second here. Um, and the last one I threw in here, just because I, I have spent a fair amount of time here recently because it's kind of fun, is Hobby King. Hobby King is really more focused on uh, like remote control planes and cars. Um, so if you want like LiPo batteries or RC remote controllers or various things, um, Hobby King's a pretty decent place to go. Um, if you were looking for 
um, battery power solutions, especially uh, like lipo solutions for doing like high power, high capacity type stuff. This is where I would go. Um, you know, they are more aimed at the like RC car, RC plane market. So like a, they would have, you know, whereas something uh, like I would have might be a little tiny, you know, 500 milliamp hour, you know, little tiny battery. Uh, something on Hobby King is going to be targeted more to like, here's a, let's see, let's go down to some of our big boys here. 300 milliamp hours, 1,000 milliamp hours, 600, you know, and they go up from there. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what, let's sort by most expensive and we'll see what the, what the priciest one is. Yeah, so here's a 20,000 milliamp hour 6S, so that's like 20 volt, 12C uh, LiPo battery. $200 for that LiPo battery. Um, let's see how much it weighs. How much do you weigh? Uh, you weigh uh, 2.6 kilograms. So like over five pounds of lithium ion battery. Love LiPo battery, I guess. Um, so if that's the kind of range that you're working in or you need like a really high current supply, this might be somewhere you would go to to find a really interesting battery and, and the charger to go along with them. So that's kind of like the, the rough rundown of the thing people I think of as hobbyist suppliers. Um, I especially wanted to get into some of the, the interesting product lines at Adafruit and SparkFun. Um, and also I should say like this is this as our snackable evening as like our fun night. Um, if there's some other stuff that you're like, hey, what's, you know, if there's categories of things that you're interested in, shout them out. If you're like, you know, hear more about shields, hear more about processors, stop me anytime. Um, I'm just going to blow through some categories that I think are interesting and you might you might not have run across before. It might be inspirational. Um, but I'm, you know, this is, this is our chill week. Like, we're just going to, like, look at some interesting stuff and I want to expose you to it in case you haven't run into it before. Um, ooh, I once again, I'm going to restart my stream controller. So that's going to be kind of the theme of tonight is what I'm guessing. Let's see if that just does it. Yeah, there we go. Come back over here. Um, so let's close those up and I will uh, see if this works. I'm going to open my, uh, yeah, let's open our Arduino related thing. So a lot of these product examples I stole from, all right, stole. I bookmarked from Adafruit because I've ordered from them a little bit more and I'm a little more familiar. Some of them will be on Sparkfront as well. But, but really just like to get a, a broad overview of the kind of stuff that's out there. So I'm now in the Adafruit shop. And this, of course, all these links are also in the page in the description. Um, some various types of Arduino that you might not have seen before. So we have, you know, of course, played a lot with the uh, the Uno, right, which, as you recall, is blue in real life. It's green on the camera. I'm so sorry. Um, so the Arduino Uno, we all know and love. There's also the Arduino Mega, right, which has a, a different kind of AT Mega chip on it. The uh, the AT Mega 2560 um, has more inputs and outputs, runs at a higher clock speed, has more memory, um, but can be programmed over a USB port just like an Arduino Uno can. We've also seen before uh, the Arduino Pro Mini. Um, that I've played with a bunch that slots in really nicely to a breadboard. Um, these come in three volt, 3.3 volt and five volt variants. Um, and they're, they're dirt cheap. Like even on Adafruit, which like, you know, when you're, when you're paying full, full price for them, um, you know, what you should be paying, they have, you know, 10 bucks a piece, which compared to an, an Uno that might be 20 bucks is pretty good. I get most of my little, uh, pro minis at, uh, Micro Center, which is a physical circuit store near me, uh, and they cost about four bucks a piece. I also, when I when I was gearing up for the little mini moving light project, I bought a bunch of them from China, and I paid about a dollar a piece, um, which is awesome because you know if you're if you want to build. 10 or 50 of something it's nice to have a, a cheaper core component and also if you're doing something that you don't quite understand like i i have burned these up a lot like I was like, oh ooh, i connected that voltage to the place i didn't mean to well it was a dollar so it's gonna be i gotta swap it out that's a little bit of a pain but like it's nice to have a thing that's kind of a disposable arduino so that's kind of a fun thing um, some other Arduino variants that exist in the world, an Arduino-like thing. So here in Adafruit, right, we see we have the Pro Mini, we have the Mega, um, and then honestly a bunch of these have been discontinued. The Yun was their original, like, Ethernet-connected Arduino. There's some other options now that we'll, we'll get to in a bit. Um, the Due was one that had a pretty high-power ARM processor on it. Um, but the ones you're more likely to see now, so Adafruit calls its variant of the uh, the... The Uno, they call it the Metro. Um, it's the exact same thing. It's just branded slightly differently. They have a smaller USB connector and some more indicator LEDs. But, you know, as you can see, it's just an Arduino Uno. Um, then they have a whole line of, like, Arduino 
Arduino compatible things. These are things that you can program with the Arduino IDE that you can usually use most of the same core libraries. So you can at least, you know, digital write, analog write, digital read, analog read, probably servo control and various things. Once you get into like the really esoteric libraries, they may not necessarily run. Um, but mostly they, they will act just like an Arduino. A lot of the times they're like an Arduino, but smaller. So one of the lines that's really cool is the Trinket line that Adafruit has come out with, um, which are really tiny. So that's a USB-C connector. And you can tell it's this is a really itsy bitsy little board. So for an application where you just need to, you know, read a button or two and turn on an LED or two or a relay or two, this is a really nice option. It's got a couple of big mounting holes, um, and a, some places to solder in some power and some connections. Um, there's a, a few variations on the trinket. Um, but they are a really, a really nifty little tiny option. Um, Adafruit also makes the Itsy Bitsy, which is actually um, slightly larger than the Trinket. Um, again, just a um, a slightly smaller form factor. I think this is their answer to the Pro Mini, um, but very similar. It's, it's, it works just like an Arduino, but smaller. So if you're looking at an application where you're like, oh, I would love to shove an Arduino in this uh, control box so that I could read a couple of these signal lines and, and choose whether to turn on an LED or not. But slamming something like an Uno in there is going to be, that's kind of overkill. And like we've talked about before, having a soldered connection is really nice. Um, something like an Itsy Bitsy or a Trinket can be a really good option. Chris mentions in the chat the Teensy, which is actually, I think, the next thing I've got here. Yeah. So the the Teensy uh, is a, a project from a company called JFRC, JSVRF, JF, I forget what they're, what the company name is. Um, these are super powerful little tiny boards, right? You can see, I think they have a size comparison here, just how small these things are, like about the size of that Pro Mini, but they tend to have super duper powerful processors on them. Um, there are various generations, they all have various pinouts, um, and you could, but you can, you can still by and large program them on the Arduino IDE, sometimes also with Circuit Python, which is a, a variant of Python that works on micro controllers um let's see if we can find what the specs on this is the 3.2 um which is the sort of the last generation of teen c so that's got a 32-bit core running at 72 megahertz with 34 io pins of which 12 can do pwm seven timers three different serial ports and i2s which is a digital sound protocol um, you jump ahead to like the current generation, the Teensy 4.1 is the most recent one. And for, you know, 27 bucks, you get something, an ARM Cortex M7, which is a really powerful microprocessor running at 600 megahertz with a, a megabyte of, of RAM, uh, eight megabytes of flash for holding programs, 55 IO pins. Like these things are super duper powerful. Um, not all of the Arduino libraries may be ported to them, so they might not be as approachable as something that's an actually an, an Arduino you know, branded product. But if you're looking to do an application that needs a lot of processing speed or interacts with a lot of different peripherals or deals with some of those more specific interactions like like I2S, like doing digital sound output, um, the Teensies are a super duper powerful and super really inexpensive option. So check out the Teensy line if that's something that you're interested in. PJRC, thank you, Chris. That's the company I couldn't think of. Um, so, so some, a couple other, uh, Arduino compatibles that are worth looking at. Um, let's see here. So SparkFun has a line of what they call LilyPad products. And these are products that are specifically meant to, uh, be sewn into wearable, into wearables, like into outfits, hats, vests, shirts, pants, cosplay, um, safety vests, illuminated purses and bags, things that are made out of fabric. And so they have this whole lily pad line um, where these things are meant to be sewn into things. They'll have these um, plated holes that are their primary points of connection where you are meant to uh, attach a bit of conductive thread that you then stitch into your product or into your, you know, your fabric whatever it is, your clothing item or your bag or your costume or whatever it is. Um, and you sort of distribute your circuit over, say, your outfit as much as you want to. So they'll have things like the Lilypad 328 board. So this is essentially an Arduino in this stitchable form factor. So it's got our, our familiar ATmega328 processor on there. You have to program it with an external processor, much like um, much like the, the little Pro Minis here that have this programming header, but that's pretty simple. 
Um, and then you can basically stitch and or solder your connections to these various external pads. And the pricing on them is, is really pretty cool. So if wearables are your thing or e-textiles are your thing, this is a really cool, uh, a really cool place to start. Um, a spark fun and Adafruit also will sell you the, the conductive thread if you want to make some of these. And they have lots of really interesting parts like a lily pad um, MP3 player, right? So if you want to, you know, make a cosplay costume of, uh, I don't know what, um, uh, Pikachu, <laughs> let's say, uh, and you want to have the ability to have your costume play sound, um, you could, you know, figure out how to, like, hold an MP3 player or, like, dewire a switch from it, or you could get one of these sewable MP3 players, which have various inputs, various speaker outputs, uh, a headphone output, a programmable output, you could stitch that right into your into your costume if you were um so the lily pad line is is a super cool you know stitchable little tiny stitchable leds that you can sew into things or a vibration motor anyway lily pad line super interesting for wearables um in that sense um let's see are they really purple yes yeah, so the, <laughs> yeah um palmer uh you probably were not here yet the colors on my little desktop cam are uh are, are pretty are, are pretty pf janky tonight if you will it's the other blue they're green the blue, the green, uh, the, but my, the hands look okay. So that was really the priority. Um, let's talk about a couple more, uh, Arduino, Arduino ish product lines. Um, oh, Hey, a couple people have sent things in. Oh, Chris, this must've been you. I realized I didn't put a space in that form for people to put their names in. Um, but I assume this, somebody has volunteered battery space.com. Um, Ooh, this is fun. So yeah, so battery, look, look at this. I've never been to batteryspace.com. Shout, shout me out, whoever put battery space in. I want to know who's using it. Um, but for lots of cool battery battery supplies, I also use um, batteriesandbutter.com um, where they primarily sell batteries. Um, they at least used to sell butter as well, but I don't think they do anymore. Um, so you get batteries. Oh, and you can get face masks now too because it's 2020 and everyone sells face masks. Um, but battery and butter, especially if you're buying batteries in bulk, like if you need a thousand double A batteries over the course of your run of your theater production, where you're using 28 double A batteries a night, this is a good place to source them from. So super cool. Um, let's see next category of things, Adafruit Arduino -y things. Oh yeah. Another, um, another cool Arduino compatible, compatible. Wow. It's going to be a night y'all. I don't think I mentioned at the beginning of this, um, I, uh, it's my first week back at my day job, um, which is, you can imagine was kind of a wild mental shift. Um, so if it seems like I'm, uh, still a little bit off kilter and having trouble, I, I've spoken to more humans in the past, like five days than I had in the previous four months. So, uh, so words, it turns out are complicated. Um, and I will, <laughs> yeah, you can, I, I will take a drink of this thing in a moment. Palmer, um, there is a Google form linked in the description of this video. Uh, that is where the, uh, the links are being shared because I don't think you, you should try, but I don't think you can post links directly in the chat. That's a good IPA. Um, the next Arduino compatible thing that I wanted to share with you is, uh, Adafruit's Flora and Gemma line, um, which are kind of like uh, the lily pad line of things um, in that they're, they, you could sew them into things. That's kind of originally what they are meant to. Adafruit hasn't pursued this this idea of sewables quite as strongly as SparkFun has. Um, what they've sort of have pivoted toward now, and we'll tie into the next product line that we look at, um, is a prototyping model where instead of using header pins and a breadboard, you're using alligator clips and clip leads. Um, this was kind of popularized by a project called the Microbit that we'll also look at in a little bit, um, actually put together by a division of the BBC that said, hey, one of the barriers to entry of these things is that, you know, little tiny wires, header connections and various things are not super approachable for anybody, let alone you know, little kids who have a hard time, you know, making sure that all the eight things line up in the right eight holes and stuff. It's a lot easier to get started if you can just clip a connection onto a connection point. And so Flora and its its little sister Gemma have these various ports um, where you can basically clip a clip lead onto or solder them into something. Um, 
but then you you know you can you can make all of your usual circuits um, without having to solder literally anything, which is a pretty cool idea. Um, this is a slightly older product, um, the the Gemma's and the Flora's of the world. So the Flora is the big version. The Gemma is kind of the trinket version of the Flora. You know, you get uh, power in uh, a few analog and digital pins and uh, ground and a, and a voltage out. There's a spot to hook up a battery because this this one kind of assumes that you might want to go portable, so you can hook up a, a battery directly to this JST connector. You get a USB connector for programming with the Arduino IDE. Um, and the whole thing's 10 bucks, right? So you can, th again, throw this at a project where throwing a full-size Arduino at is just kind of overkill. So Flora and Gemma are, are pretty cool um, little product lines for... they. Like I say, they started off as sewables. They've kind of drifted away from there now. Um, what they've kind of evolved into is... Uh, Adafruit Circuit Playground line of things, um, which I have not played with directly, um, but are super, super interesting. Um, it's going to take a second to load, I realize, as I'm trying to load all all eight of these, you know, pages, all these pictures on them at once. Um, but, like, let's look at, like, the, the Circuit Playground Express is the newest of the boards that they offer in this. Um, so in that very similar Flora and Gemma form factor, meant to be clipped onto with clip leads instead of attaching with header pins or, or 0.1-inch headers. But there is so much stuff on this little board. Um, let's let's scroll down here. And I'll make sure we get the full list right. This has so 10 NeoPixels, right? So that's these little, these little pixels here, these little RGB LEDs that you can control the color of using a digital signal so you don't have to individually PWM a red and a green and a blue for each pixel. You kind of chain them all together and then send a digital signal down the line to control their color. All right, so you get 10 of those. You get a three action motion sensor uh, accelerometer, a temperature sensor, a phototransistor light sensor, a sound sensor, a little mini tiny microphone, a tiny speaker, um, two push buttons, a slide switch, infrared receiver and transmitter, uh, and a bunch of pins that you can use as like digital and analog IO. Um, and they can do capacitive touch. So like the same way that like you don't actually have to press down on your iPhone screen for it to sense anything. It, does, it uses capacitive sensing. This can do a bunch of that as well. And then a couple of like, you know, basic power LEDs and stuff. Um, this is a super cool product. And in fact, if I was going to like, you know, if I was given free reign to teach an intro to Arduino class to say, you know, anyone below about sixth grade, this is probably the product I would choose just because there's so much interactivity built into the board itself like you could teach you could really teach the first like the what i did in the first six lessons of this back in march and april you could do all those with zero external hardware just using what's on this board and the whole thing i think is like yes yeah, 25 bucks um which is awesome you can also get the classic version for like 18 bucks and i think the difference is it it maybe doesn't have like the microphone um no it's got the microphone too I, so i actually I, see, I don't know what the difference is here um it's probably slightly less features but like how cool is that like you just get so much so much hardware on here to play around with and experiment with and learn on um there's also now, and this was this was new. I found this this week when I was digging around. There's the Circuit Playground Bluetooth Low Energy Edition, which has you can do a Bluetooth connection to. So if you wanted to, you know, if you were someone who was more interested, in, like in playing around with Bluetooth connections, like making your own iPhone or Android app, and you just wanted like a basic piece of hardware that you could connect to your phone and like turn on some LEDs or something, this would be a super cool piece of hardware. And again, twenty five bucks, like that's really cool. I'm gonna reset the stream controller again so I can get back over to the computer. It's gonna be the whole night, apparently. I don't know why it's the same piece of software that normally runs on my phone that's currently running on the um on the iPad next to me here, but apparently Apparently it's it's beer sip o'clock is what I'm learning. Um so yeah, so Circuit Playground is super cool. And of course, Adafruit will also, you know, if you wanted to buy sets of test leads along with them or test leads to header pins, right? If you wanted to get one of these super cool Circuit Playground things to play around with, but you already have a bunch of breadboard hardware, you can get something that sort of goes between the two. Um, you also just buy a whole kit, right? So for 30 bucks, you get the Circuit Playground kit and a USB cable, um, some AA batteries, um, and a battery holder, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, I put the... Um, 
the link in the in the website to the general learning portal for circuit python if you wanted to this would be a good way if you wanted to start learning a little bit of circuit python which as i sort of mentioned earlier is a a derivative of the python programming language with some special concessions to how microprocessors work um this would be a cool board to do it so there's a link in there if you wanted to start exploring um what circuit python is um let's see um, so yeah, so Circuit Playground, super, super cool stuff. Like I, I, I have never played with one of these and I actually, now that I've, after talking about them, I really want to, like they, they're just, they're so, they're so approachable. Like how cool is that? Um, and the idea is like, you, you don't have to know, you don't even have to approach soldering to get started with one of these. That was super cool. Um, let's see here. Ooh, somebody else has sent in a link. Palmer, was this you? Send a link to falstad.com. I don't know falstad.com. Let's see here. If I can get it to load. Ooh, I see we're having a little bit of... Ooh, how are things going out there? I see a, a little bit of, like, data rate whoopsie doodles going on and things. So if it's if it's lagging really bad, let me know, and we'll, uh, we'll swap a Rooney a little bit of how the cabling is working. Yeah. In fact, I might... As I see this is flagging a little bit, I might, I might do that anyway. Um, so give me, give me one second here, and I will do a little swap a -roo. But I'll leave the mic on so you can, you know, you don't get too lone and, and miss the melodious sound of my voice in the meantime. I'm literally unplugging one Ethernet cable and plugging that, plugging another one in. So I don't know quite what that's going to do to the stream. Um, and if I need to restart it. Let's see. So it, I think I'm back. If I'm lucky, I'm back. Hello? Am I back? If, uh, if you can hear me say aardvark, <laughs> I'll know that I'm back online. The whole Everything seems to think I'm back online, but I'm not 100% a, a sure. <laughs> Palmer, did you say that this is what the real website looks like? This is not like it misloading. This is just what the real thing is. That's pretty great. Um, oh, stream controller has died again. This is going to be a little bit a little bit untenable. Aardvark, you're in first. Thank you, Nate. I appreciate it. Uh, all right. Well, we're back on the original, the original hardware. Um, so that's that's a good, the original wiring, and I, it seems to be more stable this way. So I think I'll, I think I'll stick with this for tonight. Dave, Mister, thank you so much. Yes, very good, very good. All right, Chris. Well, I can always count on at least twenty five percent of people to give sassy responses. So Chris, thank you for holding on that fort. You're a real hero. Um, Falstad.com. This is super cool. Ah, a bunch of really interesting learning resources, it looks like. Yeah, Palmer? Like, a thing on... Ooh, this is cool. Like, experiment with Ohm's Law. Uh, and I change... If I change my voltage here, can I change the values of these things? Oh, yeah. This is cool. Palmer, I've never seen this before. This is false at F-A-L-S-T-A-D dot com. It looks like it's a, a circuit simulator where you can, you can mess around, like with how current is flowing in various circuits. Ooh, and it's got readouts of voltage and current over time at the various components. This is super cool. I'm going to have to come back and honestly steal some of these demos for future classes. Like, that is super cool. Diodes, op amps, MOSFETs. This is super cool. Thank you, Palmer. Falstad.com. That's awesome. Um, Let's see here. Another product line to look at. We looked a little bit at Trinket. Oh, let's talk about Particle. Particle is kind of an interesting thing. Chris, I think you had mentioned at one point an interest in um, doing things with Wi-Fi and wireless networks, which is admittedly a super, super cool topic. Um, so the Particle line of products, um, which is uh, from, from I, I think the company is just called Particle now. They used to be called something else. It's probably not Particle.com. <laughs> That'd be too lucky. Um, they make a, a line of products, the Boron the, and the Argon and their other one. <laughs> um, one of which is just uh, just like a mesh networking product, and then the boron adds to that either an LTE cellular modem or Wi-Fi, um, and then the argon adds to that um, Bluetooth as well. Um, so if you were the, the, their target audience is someone who wants to you know throw um, say uh, you know twenty of these into sensor modules and throw them all over a field and have them form sort of a spontaneous mesh network um, to communicate data back to, uh, say, one host that has a cellular LTE modem and that's doing your backhaul to get your data from your various distributed items back to um, wherever you're centralizing your information to. 
it's it's a cool idea they're not quite there with the implementation yet the mesh networking is actually not as generative as you want it to be you kind of have to do like a fairly defined mesh setup and it's not super duper flexible they also want to tie you into their ecosystem of messaging so like your messages from your argon say go back to their servers and then head to yours and you can't really configure the messages to go from directly from one of these endpoint devices to an arbitrary server or device on the internet so they're i don't really love the model that they set up but they are fairly usable i have a couple of them that i've played with i think i didn't pull them out because i was i, I didn't ever get very far with them um i also was playing with them and like in the first month they came out and the ecosystem was still kind of broken um but if you're looking for like an interesting mesh network environment to play around with the particle line um which is an ada and spark fun in other places is kind of a, a fun place to play around um other product lines oh the feather okay we got to talk about the feather so <laughs> uh I, I i maybe i i feel like i get really excited about like an hour into all of these evenings but it's just because we, we get into really cool stuff so i hope you don't mind too much um so the feather is a form factor of product so a a standardized set of connections and sizes and placements that Adafruit introduced a few years back. Um, and let's let's find an example here in a in a board that's going to be representative. Yeah, so here's a good one. So this is the Adafruit Feather 328P. So, so it's a, a 32.8, our, our old familiar AT Mega 32.8 microcontroller in this form factor. So the form factor you can tell is a little bit bigger than a Pro Mini. Um, it's a little bit, it's quite a bit smaller than an Uno. I, <laughs> to be honest, I have one of these somewhere that I bought at Micro Center a month and a half ago, and I cannot, for the life of me, find it um I, I this is i was i'm living in like 900 square feet and i cannot find this stupid board it's driving me nuts in any case um so the standardized form factor here right means that whether this is a, a board that you buy that has at mega 328p or this one that has a 32u with a bluetooth module built in or this one with an nrf 52 module which is like a a low power direct communication radio a module built into it they all have this common set of connections um so you know the reset pin if we look here like that reset pin is always first then a 3.3 volt pin then a ref and ground and that's going to be the same no matter what that processor is that built in that's that's sort of built onto the chip and that's what defines the feather form factor the other thing that you're required you're required to include if you are making a feather board um which adafruit does a lot of but it's an open spec so you could make your own too is this battery connector and some battery compatibility circuitry so the idea is that these are small enough and they're probably going to be used in sort of portable applications so you put this this same battery connector on there and then you can plug you know a little lipo battery with a with a jst connector on it something like this can plug right in there and can charge um okay will charge your battery or be powered off the battery um and it makes your projects really portable so that's just something they integrated into the the feather form factor um and like i say there's all kinds of interesting boards that have their own types of processors on them that are sort of have been built into the shape of one of these feathers so just like scrolling through the boards list here on adafruit um nrf2 module with a with bluetooth on it a cortex m4 chip which is a, pr a pretty beefy and powerful processor um that's really cool it's you know it's something you can accessible in the in the feather form factor um esp32 is a, a really common wi-fi coprocessor so if you wanted to start playing with like wi-fi applications this would be a cool place there's all the, all kinds of other interesting things and by standardizing on a common form factor or a common shape it means that any of the accessories that are designed to work with this shape will pretty much work with any of these boards so in the i think uh, just to go back to the the palmer question a while ago of like what is you know what is a shield and what do they work with um in the arduino uno environment or the arduino duemu lenove where this all started right a shield is a you know a separate circuit board with some functionality that has some nice long connection pins that's meant to slot into the top of your processor board right my pins here are a little bit bent so we'll see if this goes in nicely i think it will yeah right so it snaps in there um this one is meant to attach an xb data radio to and do some programming of um but the idea is like if you have a 
a device which needs, you know, a number of connections to it or some functionality, it's easier for a hobbyist and, and certainly faster for everybody to snap on one of these shield boards on top than to do like all of the individual hard breadboard wiring yourself. And they make these for a bunch of different, um, a bunch of different purposes. So like I said, this is one I pulled out that's meant to have a little data radio in it. Um, you might have one that has an LCD display attached to it. So this is like a, a 320 by 240 LCD display, unless I'm lying about the size of it. Um, but similarly, it has that same shield form factor on the back, and it just snaps right into the top of your Arduino Uno here. Right? Snaps right in. And the idea being that whatever pins are needed to control this LCD display and the control driver chips that are built into it are going to be pre-brought out to the appropriate connections. Mm, Palmer, great question. Can you stack shields? So in general, uh, I guess the answer is it depends. So here's a here's a good example. Um, so let's take this XB shield here for for an example, um, which you know I if I remember right, only really uses you only really need three pins to control the data radio if you're just sending data back and forth and you're not sort of configuring it on the fly. And I could go through and, and look up what they are, but actually you get to configure which pins they are in this one. You get I don't know if you can see that, but it says TX, RX, and digital. So I could say okay, well this pin is going to be tied to um, the TX line and that one to the RX line. I could get to sort of decide which pins on the Arduino are controlling the radio. And so whatever pins are that I would need to control this LCD display, um, which is going to be quite a bunch, LCD D0, D1, D2, D3. If you remember back to our LCD displays week, um, we needed like seven control lines for them and they're, and they're hardwired on here. But I could pick for the control lines that I needed for the XB shield to be different from the LCD shield, right? So I would, I would need to be, you know, sort of cautious about it and figure out which pins each one was going to use. But then in theory, I could just use them both. By, and assuming I had the space in my Arduino for um, all of the various libraries I might need to talk to these things, there's no reason in general that you can't stack shields and continue to use them together. Now, some shields, like this LCD shield, don't have female headers on top, right? LCD display. <laughs> Thanks, Palmer. Yeah, yeah. Drink every time you get LCD display. Um, uh, LED, LED diode, I suppose. <laughs> ATM machine. Um, so you, you obviously wouldn't be able to stack something on top of this LCD shield um, because it doesn't have those those female headers on top. Um, but a lot of shields, a lot of shields do because they don't want to limit your possibilities of control. Um, here's another shield. This is a, an Ethernet shield, which is actually still still hardwired into a prototype that I was building with it. Um, this might look a little familiar to to Lee and Travis. This was the prototype of the. Uh, the SACN uh, shield device that I was helping prototype for them. But similarly, like, you know, I have a, the XP shield on there. I have the Ethernet shield now also stacked on top of there. And assuming they use different pins or I can configure them in my in my code to use different pins, this is a totally valid thing to do. Um, it can sometimes be a little hard, depending on the specific shield, um, to determine from its documentation before you buy it which pins you're going to need to use. Um, that can be a little tricky. Um, but in general, um, there are ways to, the, the problem would be like, you know, as we've seen, like the serial port on your Arduino is always on pins one and two. And if your shield, you know, has to use that serial port, then another shield that also needs that serial port, you know, wouldn't be able to use those same pins because you've already used them up, so to speak. Um, but that's the gist of shields, right? It's a, it's a stackable, snappable connection. Um, and a shield is, I should say, specifically the term that refers to something that matches the size of an Arduino Uno. Um, the, the, stackable ob the stackable circuit board concept has been adopted by lots and lots of different manufacturers, and they've all given them different names. So going back to where this all started, right, for the Uno, the term is a shield. For the feather form factor, this smaller form factor, you the, the snap-on boards are called wings, which is pretty adorable. Um, but much like the Arduino Uno, they are, you know, sort of stackable, snappable devices um, that add additional functionality to your processor. So here's an ethernet feather wing right so on top uh, on the bottom here is a basically a processor of your choice right because they all have the same set of connections so that could be an at mega 328 it could be a cmd 51 could be a cortex m7 you know bit, lots of power little power wi-fi built in or not all these various options but because they all have the same connections you should be able to 
generally attach any of these feathers to the top of them and just have it work. So if you wanted to add Ethernet to your project or let's see, or just some additional prototyping space, let's say you want to build up your own little circuit here and then snap it on like a wing to your circuit board. You could get this prototyping uh, feather wing, they call it. Um, Ethernet one, um, Here's a little, uh, a singular relay, right, that's, that snaps onto the top of your feather system and uses, you know, would use probably one pin somewhere to control whether that relay is on or off. Um, but here, here's a cool example. It's like if you hooked it up to a feather that had Bluetooth connectivity, <coughs> or maybe it's Wi-Fi connectivity in this example, right, you, you take your feather, you attach your, your wing to the top of it, and now you have a relay controller. Um, you can also buy things that are called feather doublers and triplers. So you could have multiple of these wings hooked up to a single feather processor. And there's all kinds of these different feathers. There's a, a GPS one for, for looking at GPS position via satellite or um, a high precision accelerometer or an alphanumeric display. These are super fun. It's like if you wanted to put a little four digit seven segment display in something, you could just snap it onto the top of one of these feather processors. Um, servo drivers, all kinds of interesting things. So so the Feather ecosystem is really vibrant. Adafruit makes a bunch of these boards, um, but they also publish this standard freely. Um, so you can, you know, anyone can make a board in the Feather form factor. And, and though Adafruit has covered a lot of ground with a lot of the more common processors, a lot of people have said, hey, yeah, you know, I'm working with a a pick 16 um, and I'm, I'm building up a new board for it because I want to I want to do a bunch of things with it and I'm not sure it doesn't really matter that much to be exactly where the connections are so I'm just going to make it in in this feather form factor I'm going to give it these common points of connection um, and then people are free to it gives the ability to do more remixing with these boards because there's this common interface already defined super super cool concept um, so the, the feather line is a really powerful one, especially if you're looking to get into, um, some of these more, you know, these processors, which themselves have additional capabilities like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or data radios. Super interesting. Um, I need a, I need a beer sit break and then we'll, and then we'll carry on. and then unmute myself like a professional uh, and talk about some more things. Um, oh, while we're talking about shields, I, I bookmarked a bunch of interesting shields to talk about. This is Adafruit's Arduino shields section. And like I say, a shield is something specifically for the Arduino Uno form factor. Although um, one of the cool things about these, these Arduino Megas, um, which is uh, an they're another pretty common variant of Arduino, um, is you might notice that the, the sort of front half of it, if you will, is the same shape as an Arduino Uno. So, right? so you have this set of connectors here is the same as this set of connectors here. And that means that a shield that is meant for the Uno can snap into a Mega as well. Can snap into a Mega as well. Right? And you still have all this space out here for additional I.O. Um, this is a really, a really, this is the thing I'm going to save my butt a couple of times, um, where I've gotten into a situation where I'm prototyping something with an Uno, uh, and I've got this shield that's providing like, you know, eight channels of servo motor control, and I run out of, um, usually it's local memory for me. I have too many variables. Or I'm trying to store too many things in an array and I just, I run out of room. And the easiest thing to do in that situation, assuming you have the physical space, is just throw money at the problem and throw uh, an Arduino Mega at it, right? Because the same code will run and you can attach the shields to the Mega just like you can in Uno. Um, so I, you know, basically upload the, upload the code to that. You get like 30K more of local variable storage. You snap your shield on and you're good to go. Um, so the, the shields work with both, I guess, the Uno and the Mega Form Factor, just to say. Um, and they make shields nowadays for all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, NFC and RFID, like the little tap cards you might use to get into your office building. Um, the Wave Shield is pretty cool, and uh, SparkFun makes kind of a version of this too. Uh, you load an SD card with sound effects, and it presents a really uh, simple interface for playing them back out of this little uh, eighth-inch jack. Right, so if you need a, if you're making an Arduino powered device that needs some really basic sound interactivity, you know, you want to um, have some 
buttons and switches that light things up and do things and you want to play some sounds, uh, this is a really easy way to do it because you basically send a command that says play sound one now, play sound two now. Uh, you know, if if button is high, then play sound three. Um, and that's really cool. And again, it's like that's like a $20 product. That's a really easy way to add functionality to to your devices. Um, they have these these uh, these LCD displays. <laughs> <laughs> these or or TFT for uh, for touch shields uh, for the Arduino as well, and these are super cool. I have a little off-brand one here, um, but a lot of the ones they sell, in addition to being displays, right? So you could add a little tiny display directly to your device. They're also touchscreen devices. Um, uh, most of them are resistive touch instead of capacitive touch, um, but that basically means when you touch the screen you you are essentially manipulating the what looks to the arduino like the wiper of a potentiometer so you read a couple of values in on the analog pins and that gives you the location that the user is is touching something at and you could use that to make a little you know button interface display you could do like the demo is doing here and do you know a drawing or doodling you could take somebody's signature you can also of course display image back to them a lot of these cards i, I guess i don't know if the adafruit one does yeah it certainly does um have in addition to um the lcd they have a slot for a, a mini a micro sd card with the idea being that if you have a display there's a good chance you might want to show pictures so you can load images onto your sd card and then just show them on your screen with labels or you could have a, an image of your error message or what have you um so a super cool thing to play with um and an easy way to add some like interesting graphical flair and functionality to your project um, there's all kinds of interesting shields out there, um, including shield versions of some of the things that we've built by hand over the past 19 weeks, um, like wiring up an LCD display, which remember was it was a little bit kludgy. I don't I don't think I've seen Michael Trudeau out there tonight, but if he is, I know we had a very time troubleshooting that LCD display. Um, but you can also get one that's attached to a shield that just attaches to your Arduino Uno. Um, in fact, I think I have one here. Oh yeah. So uh, so after doing so many weeks of demos with that uh, that that our favorite janky LCD LCD display, I just committed to it at this point, Palmer. I'm just gonna say it. Um, committing to that janky LCD display module, I caved and bought. Uh, I guess it's not a shield. It's it's one with an external serial communication module that hopefully will work um, just a little bit better for me than doing it all by hand every time. Um, the shields category is a super fun place just to come and like look around like here's a shield that has like 40 of these little NeoPixel RGB LEDs or an e-ink display right which um, can display basic sort of monochrome images but draws very very little power uh, except when the display is changing so this would be really cool if you were pursuing one of those low power applications where you, you wanted to run on battery for a long time but you still needed a display um, e-ink or e-paper displays um, basically use no power except when they're flipping a, a, a pixel from white to black or in this case white to black or red um, and vice versa so a super cool a super cool place to come in and play around in um yeah, that's that's the gist of of shields is that they're they provide functionality that snaps into the top of of their Arduino. Um, one more little product line that I want to touch on before we sort of leave the hobby electronic sites behind. Um, and I will still, you know, if, if anyone, if you can think of things from Adafruit and our spark or any of these places that I haven't hit, please pop them in that little form. And I'm super curious. Um, but one thing that I think is really cool that I wanted to feature before we left these behind um, is. Uh, that both Adafruit and SparkFun, at around the same time, I guess for Adafruit it was 2018, SparkFun maybe a little bit, uh, it was 2017, um, sort of, you know, along the lines of their goals to make making and circuits and electronics more approachable, realized that another one of these barriers, in addition to like, you know, the soldering of the things that we could sort of supplement with uh, clips and wires, um, it would be nice if there was a, a common interface to hook up something like a basic sensor or controller to an Arduino or a microcontroller um, that sort of had a, you know, hook up one cable to your uh, temperature sensor and one cable to your Arduino, and then they would just be able to talk to each other. And so both companies came up with essentially the same thing at the same time with slightly different connectors um and they're they're essentially cross compatible which is super cool so in the R in the adafruit world this line is called the stemma or stemma qt which is the the smaller version of stemma connector um they look like this little guy it's a little four pin jst connector um and what it is 
Um, let's see if there's a good pinout map here. Yeah, so it's four wires. You get ground, power, uh, SDA, and SCL, which are the, the data and clock lines for I squared C or I2C, which I realize we, we never talked about, but we as if we're going to talk about Raspberry Pi, we certainly should. Um, but it's basically a common way of one microchip talking to another. IIC or I squared C actually stands for inter integrated circuit. Um, so integrated circuits talking to each other. Um, so he said, well, why don't we just wrap up power and ground in these signal lines into this common little JST connector? Um, and then you could do things like, you know, plug one end of a cable into your Arduino like thing, plug the other end into your sensor uh, or your whatever it is, and they could just talk. So, for example, looking in the STEMA category and Adafruit here, um, you might have something like. Uh, here's a SHTC3 temperature and humidity sensor for Stemma and Stemma QT and or Quick. Quick is the spark fun analog of Stemma, um, which is and so there's Stemma, which is the large version. Stemma QT and Quick are smaller, um, but they are the same size. So basically, you get this you know this useful little temperature sensor module here. It's got some places to solder on wires if that's the way you want to go, but it also will have these often two different connectors for this Stemma interconnect. The idea being you connect one side to your Arduino-like board that has a Stemma connector on it, and you would connect something else. You could daisy chain, excuse me, daisy chain through to your next sensor or motor, whatever it is, because these are just passing, you know, power and ground and a data and a clock line along sort of through them. So if you had an application that needed temperature and humidity and flame sensing and light sensing, you could just plug one into the next, into the next, into the next, and plug it into your Arduino. And as long as you handled the addressing, which is sort of the basis of I squared C, each device has an address that you talk to it at. You'd say, okay, um, ask for some data from address one. I know that's my temperature sensor and get some data back and ask for the light value from address two and get that data back. So it really is another way of like making these things sort of more easy to quickly interconnect and prototype with in this way. Um, and there's all kinds of products that have these, these Stemma or Quick connectors on them. Um, digital potentiometer, um, distance and ranging sensor. So, you know, something if you're doing sort of a, a time of flight distance sensing. Um, uh, digital potentiometer, uh, digital to analog converter. So if you're doing analog voltage output in some way, six degree accelerometer, all kinds of stuff. Um, and a lot of boards from Adafruit and SparkFun have these, these Stemma connectors on them you can attach to. Um, and of course, you can also get various adapter cables from, from Stemma to these pin headers for your circuit boards or whatever. Um, you can also get just like basic modules, like a push button, right? You can just, you know, hook up your push buttons directly to your, your Stemma connector. Um, and there are adapters between various things. You can also get a Stemma connector for a Raspberry Pi. Right, so like all of these sensors that you might start getting familiar with in the Arduino landscape can also plug in to a Raspberry Pi form factor using either you know something large like this, and we'll look at Raspberry Pi specific stuff in the next few weeks. Um, but you know, hook, hooking stuff to a Raspberry Pi is not always as simple or approachable as hooking it to an Arduino. But with these quick ports, these Stemma ports, um, you just sort of hook a little four pin cable between one and the other. Um, they also make a, a you know a smaller version of that uh, of that little attachment piece right there. Um, there's also a Stemma and Quick Feather Wing. So all those feather form factor boards that says four of those connectors. So you you slap your you know Bluetooth enabled processor on there. You quickly hook up a six degree accelerometer and a little display output this one has um, and a pressure sensor. And now you have also everything's all connected and you've done basically zero soldering. Um, so the Stemma and Quick uh, connector categories from both uh, SparkFun and Adafruit are really fun to play around in. SparkFun's uh, analog of the Arduino Uno, their sort of branded version, is the red board line. Um, and they have a Quick connector right on your Arduino Uno analog there. So you basically you take what is essentially an Uno and you can start sort of quickly wiring up um, all of these various um these various sensors that are that are compatible with Quick or with Stemma. Um, they also make some, you know, this is a board with a, a an XB radio data radio on it that also has a Quick connector down here in the corner that you can do direct hookups to these sensors. Does that all sort of make sense? Like what this ecosystem is, this Stemma and Quick ecosystem? You basically each cable has power and ground um, built into it and, and signal lines to, to make it really easy to sort of plug one module into the next, into the next, into the next. Again, just just you know trying to figure out what the form factor is that makes these things as approachable, 
as easy to work with as possible and, and as rapidly prototypable as possible. You know, and this could be for nerds like us who are interested in like learning new things and trying new things. Um, it could be, you know, someone who's who's not that interested in learning how to solder, but wants to, you know, for their hobby or for their company, um, wants to have a little like Bluetooth a remote temperature sensor and they don't want to learn how to do any of this stuff but you you buy a, a feather board and a shield and you plug the connectors into each other and you download some code and it works um it's a super cool approachability idea i think um so anyway that's essentially the stemma and quick line of things a super fun thing to play with for like rapid prototyping uh palmer asked the two ecosystems aren't cross compatible oh excellent question so they are they are actually mostly cross compatible um i think in the um in the big list of links uh there is a um one of the things i linked to is this comparison table um so so like I say, so Stemma is the larger version. That's a two millimeter pin pitch JST connector. So there's two millimeters between every pin. That, that sort of was the original. There's now Stemma QT, which is half the size. It's one millimeter pitch. And Stemma QT and Quick are the same connector and the same pin out. So they are essentially cross compatible. The major difference is that Quick uh, is 3.3 volts only, whereas Stemma and Stemma QT can be 3.3 or five volts so you can always plug a sorry it's gonna it feels a little bit like word mush um you can always plug a stemma sensor into a quick controller because they will always be at three volts but you can't always plug a quick sensor into a stemma controller because it might be a five volt controller trying to shove five volts down the throat of a 3.3 volt sensor or something um, so the, the chart is linked if you want to like go back and trace through all that, all that gobbledygook. Um, but, but basically they are compatible. It's just that occasionally you ha might have devices that are not quite voltage compatible. They also, I think both companies sell a voltage level shifter that you basically put in between if you, if they're not compatible and say, okay, I have five volts here and three volts here, just make them work together and that will be fine. Um, so, so the short answer is yes, they're compatible with some slight exceptions. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the that's the gist of it for um, sort of hobby level suppliers. Um, I need a, a little a beer sip before we get into the next category. But questions, comments, issues, concerns, things I've missed. Sidebar: From what I can tell, excuse me, on my little dashboard here. Seems like the lag has maybe gotten a little better since switching Ethernet cables. Don't know if that's true or not. If people are noticing generally better or generally worse or or about the same would be also fine too. But that's what it that's what it seems like from my end. Um, what else we gotta talk about tonight? Uh let's see. Ooh, let's talk about um we'll jump we'll jump around a little bit tonight, but I want to talk about um sort of professional component suppliers. So Adafruit, SparkFun, Pololu are great for like, I need a, a hobbyist level board. I, I want something that's approachable as easy as possible, right? Sort of the other end of the electronic spectrum is like, you know, buying components. Like I need uh, a bunch of resistors, capacitors, processors. Actually, hold that thought one sec. Sort of the opposite of tummy cam back here. <sighs> Reach into my parts bins as I warned you, might happen tonight. Um, <laughs> Nate's curious about the difference between the two Ethernet cables is. So the original one uh, what is run through a um, a Wi-Fi extender, which is also a um, uh, also a, a Ethernet over power line extender from where the router is in our living room to my little home workshop here. Um, the current solution, which seems to be better, is a 50 foot Cat6 cable that's run down my hallway <laughs> to, to that router. So I'm a little bummed that that one's the better one, but I'm not, I guess, entirely surprised. Um, Palmer has a question. What's the reliability of stuff from places like, ah, we're going to talk about Banggood and eBay and stuff as well and where they, where they are good and where they are bad. That's going to be our next category. So that's not a tangent at all. You're just a little ahead of me, which I love. It's great. Um, so I'm pulling out here, what we talk about things like professional electronic supplies. So like, for example, for the, for the mini moving light project, which I'm sure you're all sick of hearing about, um, I needed some, uh, 47 micro Henry, uh, 
inductors that could handle half an amp in a specific form factor. So I went, I, you know, that's something that's something you can buy from DigiKey, right? That is a professional electronics component that's supposed to be on the circuit board. Or it's not something you can buy from Adafruit. So I went to DigiKey and ordered exactly what I wanted, right? You can get any, everything from inductors to uh, DMX transceiver chips to a lot of them come in these anti-static bags because static electricity can can damage um, semiconductor electronics. Um, here's a bunch of, oh, here's a bunch of uh, AT Mega 328 processors that I ordered that I was soldering onto circuit boards. I can't get this one out of the gaff tape, but you can see it. <laughs> you can see it hiding underneath there for sure. Um, so when you're looking for something that's like a, a chip or a product or a resistor, um, and whether that's something like, you know, a, a semiconductor product or I, you just need, a, you know, actual resistors and capacitors, somewhere you might go is like a professional electronics distributor. So that'll be sort of our next category of things. Um, I want to sort of breeze through some options that you may or may not have heard of. And then I want to do just a little quick um, navigating uh, tutorial on DigiKey specifically, just because that's the one I use the most often and I, I like them a lot. Um, but it, the interface is a little bit uh, intimidating the first time you use it, and it shouldn't be. So we'll just go through how you would order some products from there. Um, so like I say, DigiKey, D-I-G-I-K-E-Y.com is a really common one. Mouser is the other, at least stateside one that is, is most commonly used. Um, you might also get some things from Newark, um, Newark, uh, Newark and Element 14 were two separate companies, one in the USA and one in the UK. They are now merged under Farnell, who's an electronic supplier. I don't really use them that much. They don't seem to have as good selection. Um, I think they are used more by people who are, um, doing sort of commercial orders on lots and lots of products. Um, the last one to, to mention is LCSC.com. Um, they are the parts distribution arm of JLC PCB, which is a PCB manufacturing service. It's the one we, we looked at very briefly at the end of the how to make a PCB episode. Um, there's so two halves of the same company. Um, they are located in, in Shenzhen, I think, in China. They are uh, easily the cheapest supplier. It can be a little bit harder to find actual brand name parts, um, but for, you know, basic things like resistors and capacitors, they are certainly cheaper. Shipping can take longer and you do a little bit run the risk of the parts being not necessarily of the highest quality. Um, a couple more cool websites to mention in this vein are findchips.com uh, and Octopart, um, which are both uh, part search engines. So if you're trying to find um, you know, a specific part and, and are wondering what the pricing is like in various places, this is a cool place to be able to find it. So let's see, if I was trying to find ATmega328P-AU, uh, which is the kind that's on the Uno, I could search for it in Octopart and I could see, oh, here we go. Uh, it's a part from Microchip, and here's, I can see I could buy it at DigiKey, at AVNet, at RS Components, at Rochester. Um, I could look at all the various suppliers, how many they have in stock, what the price breakdown is, and a lot of the suppliers will give you a price break, you know, cost of one is such and such, but if you buy more than one, if you buy 10 or 100, you might get a, a certain price break on them. Um, and you can see various, various suppliers, you can sort by various things. Um, so Octopart and Fine Chips are, are both very similar in this respect um, and are cool, especially if you're trying to track down like a, a slightly more obscure part or you just want to do price comparisons on the single part that you think you're going to use. So Octopart is super fun to play with. Palmer says, Nuo is my go-to for Hellerman tools and sleeves. Ah, cheaper than audio slash A2 suppliers. Tell your audio friends. Palmer, I think what you mean is you should tell your audio friends because I suspect all of my audio friends are also your audio friends, I think. <laughs> um... So all of these uh, manufacturers, especially DigiKey and Mouser, work in essentially the same way. They have an enormous warehouse of things and, you know, where to find lots and lots more millions of things. So how do you find anything in a catalog of a million parts? Um, well, let's dig down into DigiKey here. Um, because uh, there's there's kind of two different worlds you might find yourself in. One is the the very specific part. Like once again, let's try finding an AT Mega 328P-AU, the microprocessor I want. Um, and I see I've got four results. And I scroll down here. And I see I've got my four results sorted out here, and they all look like they're the same. 
Um, so how do you determine which is the one you want? Well, there's a few things that might distinguish them. Let's zoom out just a little bit here. Um, one is they might not be exactly quite the same. Like we can see this is the ATmega 328P AURTR or AURCT. I probably have to go into the data sheet to see exactly how those were different. Um, the AURDKR might be something else differently here, AURND and so on. Um, so it might be something different in the chip, or it might just be a difference in the way that they are packaged. If I come over here to the the packaging line, I should say this is the same in DigiKey or Mouser. I'm just using DigiKey for this example. We'll see that this first line item here, which has the best price, right, a dollar seventy three for processor, um, is packaged as a tape and reel process. So that means when these parts come to me, they would be packaged in something like. Oh, uh, let's see, something like, oh, here's actually, this is actually a uh, tape without the reel, right? So this is those inductors I was talking about before. They come in this, what is actually a little bit of a plastic spool of tape. Um, so this would, this would be manufactured where there would be thousands and thousands of these wrapped around a spool. And these little holes in the side of the tape are so that this can be fed into a robotic pick and place machine that automatically you know peels the backing off of this tape and picks the parts out and puts them on the circuit board for you right so when you see tape and real packaging you can assume that it's something that comes on that tape that is meant to be you know put into a machine and that's why the minimum order quantity for this type is 2,000 processors right you cannot buy this line item and have get shipped them less than 2,000 of them that probably means that a full spool of those is 2,000 objects which if you know if that's the world you're living in, this is a great way to order something like that. But I suspect for a lot of our projects, it's not. Probably what you're looking for is this cut tape option. And that's the option I showed you a moment ago, where someone will walk over to the, the bin of these spools, cut off exactly how many you're supposed to get, and ship them to you. Um, in that case, you're paying $2.08 per processor as opposed to $1.73 because you're paying a little bit for labor and you're not getting those cost savings there. But you can buy just one of them or 10 or 100 or something like that. This last option, DigiReal, um, is a service where um, if you are manufacturing circuit boards, um, your manufacturer w ins will insist that your parts come on these reels so they put them into their machine and, and you know, assemble your circuit board for you but it's often you know in, in this situation like let's say I want to make a hundred boards with this processor on them I don't want to have to buy a reel of 2000 I want to buy a reel of you know maybe 110 so I have a few spares this digi reel is just a way of saying digi key will um, basically cut off 110 of these things for you and wind them onto a new spool so you can ship it to your manufacturer and not have to send them you know a full spool of a thousand you know two thousand of these things um so in this case, this cut tape option is what I'm looking for. So that's sort of one end of the spectrum, right? You search for the thing, the exactly the thing you want. It comes up with some options. One I can only buy 2,000 of. So I'll, I'll buy the one I can buy one of, piece of cake. What if your option is at the other end of the spectrum and you want something much more general like a, you know, a resistor? How do you know... Uh, what is right because we you know so resistors live for example in the passives section they're not an active device they're not doing any thinking it's just a little resistor so I'll go into resistors here uh, you can see I've been here before um, and I'll say oh I'd like capacitors crystals filters let's scroll down here uh, LEDs ferro wires ah resistors ah through hole resistors I'd like some resistors please and then when I click into the resistors product I can see that there are 511,000 possible resistors for me to buy how in the holy heck am I going to start navigating a list of 511,000 resistors to narrow down to the singular product that I need let me give you a few tips for that um, so if we scroll down, we see, you know, just, they will start to list, you know, in some particular order, all 511,000 of them for you, but that's probably not what we, what we, we want to start with. We want to start with the filtering section up at the top here. Um, and I like to start with, if I'm going to be, you know, buying something for a project soon, the two boxes that I check first are in stock and normally stocking. So in stock means they have it right now and normally stocking means they will, you know, usually have it at some point in the future. If you're just sourcing a, a part for something that you, oh, stream controller died again. Um, just sourcing a part for, you know, something you think you're gonna use in a future project, you could uncheck this in stock box and just do normally stocking because if they don't have it now, they'll, they'll try and get it back in with the next week. And for your project, that might be enough, but I usually check in stock and normally stocking. I'll hit apply filters and we'll see already we've gone down from 511,000 to 20,000 resistors. So that means they really only have 
you know, 20,000 resistors that are 20,000 kinds of resistors that are in their warehouse right now and that they guarantee they will usually have in their warehouse. That means the other 490,000 resistors are just products that they catalog and know are out there and will get for you if you need them. And some of them are very specialized projects that you you might need, you know, a 100 watt 2.1 ohm resistor for your motor driver or what have you. Um, but for things that they have in their warehouse right now, which will probably fulfill our common needs, in stock and normally stocking good places to start. All right, where do we go from there? Um, well, um, things that might be helpful to know are like how much resistance you actually want it to have. Let's say we were buying LEDs to be a a ballast for our LEDs, and I want them to be a 220 ohm resistor, right? So I can select 220 ohms from this resistance category here. I can also give it for a numerical valued category. I can give it a minimum and a maximum value. So I could say something, anything between 210 and 230 ohms. Right, in case I, I don't really care that much about what the actual value is. And this is actually a good thing to do if you're, you know, let's say you're you're designing a circuit with an LED in it and you decide that the perfect value for a resistor is 225 ohms, right? Which is not a common value of resistor, but you you might not know that. You might say, ah, 225 ohms would be perfect. What I would do in, in any situation is come in here and either just say, all right, well, 225 would be perfect, but I'll take anything down to 215 or anything up to 237, and I'll apply the filters from there. And that cuts me down to 225 results. That's pretty good. And when I sort these by price down at the bottom here, which I'll go down to uh, unit price and sort ascending, what I suspect I will see is that all of the low priced options are 220, 220, 220, 220, resistor 220 ohms, resistor 221, 232. 220, 220, right? So by sort of selecting a slight spread of values around what you think your design value is, you you sort of give yourself the ability to discover what the most common value is because that will almost always be the cheapest option, right? So if you, you know, you think you need a, uh, a 2.7 microfarad capacitor, you select everything from say two to three and it might, it'll probably pop out at you that really 2.2 is a lot cheaper and more common. And you go back and you figure, well, I, you know, I could save 50 cents apart if I use a 2.2. Is that good enough? And for this circuit, it is. And for that circuit, it's not. You pay the money to get the part that you need. Um, so now we're down to, to 200 and, uh, what well, I say, 225 resistors. Let's narrow it in one more time. And this is where it's sort of domain-specific knowledge starts to come in. Um, but often what you're paying for, especially for passive components, is tolerance, right? How close to the nominal value is your part actually going to get? Something with a really tight tolerance, like 0.01e, percent really spot on is useful for things like if you're using this resistor to measure current right you're measuring the voltage drop across a resistor to establish what a current is but you know i'm just going to ballast my led i don't really need that much precision i'll select you know something really loose and you'll see here again if i click on 10 percent, it tells me there's three resistors remaining if i click on five percent i have 127 so plus or minus five percent is obviously the common value that's probably going to be the cheapest i'll start by that and then finally, I might say, you know, going back to week three, when we talked about fundamentals of electricity, I know this resistor is going to dissipate, I don't know, about half a watt. So I'll say half a watt and one watt, I'll apply my filters. And now I'm left with out of those 511,000 options we started with, I have 31 options that fit the bill. They are 220-ish ohm resistors, 5% tolerance, I'll sort by price ascending. And then this is the point where you just kind of, you know, Pick the cheapest one, frankly. Um, ooh, I also, I don't want to buy 5,000 of them in this tape in real format. I want to buy, say, 50 of them to play with. So I'm going to say, I'm going to look at prices at quantity 50. And it will immediately remove those options that require me to buy thousands of them and say, hey, if you buy 50 of this resistor from Stackpole Electronics Inc., it will cost you three cents a piece. We can click in there and see, yep, that's very good. Resistor, half watt resistor, 5%, 220 ohms. There are 25,000 of them in stocks. So they'll gladly ship me 50. And it'll also show down here, you know, what the price breaks are at various quantities. So if I buy, I have a little hidden behind my face there. If I buy one of them, if I just buy one resistor, they're going to charge me 10 cents for it. Because the labor on selling me just one resistor is kind of silly, right? If I buy 100 of them, they're going to cost me 2.5 cents a piece. If I buy 1,000, of them, they'll cost me one cent a piece. Um, DigiKey especially is really pretty good about catching when your price breaks are, are going to hit. So for example, um, when I go from 
uh, let's say 25 pieces or cost me, when I, if I buy at least 25 pieces, they cost 4.28 cents a piece. If I get to 50, they cost me 3.2 cents. So if I order 49, I'm going to pay this 25 cent price, but I'm going to you know get just slightly less than 50. I think what happens, and let's find out if this is true. If I say, I'd like to order 49 of these resistors, add them to my cart, um, and it pops up with this thing and says, hey, if you buy 49 resistors, you're going to pay a total of $2.10 for them. But if you bought 50 of them, you'd actually pay less in total because we'll give you this cool price break. Do you just want to buy 50 of them? So they do this, this really nice thing for you. You don't have to like work out where things are, you know, jump and are cut off. It'll catch this for you. So thanks, DigiKey. Um, then you just add them to your cart and you buy them. That's all there is to it. They take credit cards. They ship right to you. Um, DigiKey Shipping ships from Minnesota is their primary warehouse. Um, ships in like two days, typically. Um, so if I'm ordering for a uh, a work project that I need parts you know, like in you know in the next couple of days, uh, DigiKey is where I go. Or Mouser. Sometimes they have slightly different selections. Um, but uh, that's where like where where you would order sort of professional grade parts from. Um, Let's see, for a hobbyist, is there a reason besides price not to buy things like resistors at a higher wattage rating that you might need? Um, good question. So uh, I guess a wattage rating would be fairly specific to a uh, a resistor, because often you're not worried too much. I guess in, you'd be worried about like a current rating in an inductor um, or a voltage rating in a capacitor. Um some reasons might be size. Um, the higher powered resistors tend to be quite big. Um, and I guess, you know, if we're talking about the difference between a quarter watt and a half watt, they're not that different. Um, but if you'll excuse a little, uh, here, I, I remember not to do tummy cam. I think I have my bin of power resistors here. Uh, and if I can't find it soon, I'll, oh, here we go. There we are. I think these might've come out at some other point as well. Um, but that is a five watt 2.2 ohm resistor right and that thing is compared to a let me get a little a little resistor like a quarter watt resistor that we're more used to um you can see just the size difference of these two things is pretty silly um other reasons you might not, I mean, for, for general use, quarter watt versus half watt versus eighth watt really doesn't make a huge difference. Price is the only real big one. Um, for high speed signals, it makes a little difference because um, the higher wattage resistors tend to um, have worse parasitic uh, uh, elements to them. So uh, this, is, this is getting into a little bit deeper than we have so far, but, you know, essentially what this is, is a... Uh, a wire coming in and a coil of wire with resistive material sort of spaced in between it. That's what sort of makes up the resistance of a resistor. And at higher frequencies, that coil of wire starts to act first like a capacitor and then like an inductor. So when you when you get to into these sort of megahertz and especially gigahertz range, resistors stop acting like resistors and start acting like other things. And the higher wattage versions tend to be even worse about that. For our purposes, no, not really. Let's see. Uh, Palmer says smaller wattage things. Yeah, for sure. The five watt ones are a little bit special. Amazon and eBay have resistor kits and have half watt because they might be, they're really, you know, other than price, a half watt versus a quarter watt. If you're not worried about the, the small size difference between them, not a huge difference, not, not really a, a, a reason to do one versus the other for most purposes, I would say. There, uh, there, you'd be hard pressed in our environment to find a place where a quarter watt resistor would be better than a half watt resistor for some application, other than size, I suppose. It's a fair question. Um, yeah. Uh, DigiKey has all kinds of stuff. <laughs> uh, they, you know, any any kind of electrical component that you can can kind of think of. Um, so it can be kind of fun to come and, and tool around in DigiKey if you're a nerd, and I am just assuming that you all are. Um, so, you know, everything from, especially, you know, in the passives category, capacitors, crystal oscillators, fans, filters, all this kind of stuff, semiconductors, right? So um, everything from your, your evaluation boards, your Arduinos and your development kits, all your various diodes and transistors and all kinds of things. So it can be kind of a fun thing to just dig through and, and see, see what is out there. Um, they will also sell you things like multimeters and panel meters and things like that. Um, they are definitely not the cheapest source for any of this kind of stuff for relays and panel meters you're paying industrial prices you know 150 bucks for a a factory quality re-rake because that's their target market right is, is sort of professional um industrial applications um 
Yeah, that is the that is the gist of a place like a DigiKey or a Mouser. Um, they will also. Oh no, I'm thinking of something else. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're buying sort of sort of uh, you know specific components to to kit out a specific project, um, that can be a, a good place to go. Um, questions? Beer time? Question. helps if I unmute myself, I suspect. Um, I got two more categories to breeze through uh, just just quickly. Um, and then, I don't know, I'm just start, I have some things pulled out of boxes that I thought might be fun to look at and explain where they came from, and then, and then that'll be a uh, That'll be it. Um, so the the next category of things uh, to jump to Palmer's question are what I would call overseas suppliers or things that come from China. Um, the sort of three, I guess, really two big players in this space that, that I have ordered from at least are uh, AliExpress, which is a subset of Alibaba.com um, and Banggood. Um, so Alibaba is a site where you can you can buy pretty much anything like let's buy uh, a wind turbine um, and I can find everything from like a sort of a small hobbyist level one to I could buy sort of a turbine for a power plant on Alibaba. Um, let's say I wanted to buy a cement truck. Um, I can buy a full cement truck on Alibaba today for only 20 to 40,000 US. Pretty good. Um, I'm also for some reason in the Russian Alibaba, which is strange. Um, let's see, I could also buy, uh, let's say if I wanted to buy socks, I could buy, uh, you know, any of hundreds of kinds of socks. Alibaba really started as a place for factories in China and suppliers to connect with each other, to form business relationships, to establish supply lines. <laughs> Chris says the shipping cost of the truck. Oh, I didn't look at how much it cost to ship a cement truck. I guess it depends whether it has cement in it or not. Um, I've also, I'm, I'm still in Russian. Oh, here, let's translate. Uh, let's see. Concrete output. You get 10 CBM of concrete. That's pretty good. Um, estimated delivery, 20 days. Custom emblem. Packaging and delivery. It'll come, <laughs> it's going to be a process, I think is what we're learning here. Um, so Alibaba, if you're, if you're looking to buy a hundred of something or something like a cement truck, Alibaba can be a place to go. But for a lot of my shopping, at least, I go to AliExpress, which essentially is the consumer offshoot of Alibaba, which where suppliers who say, you know, hey, I would, um, I'd like to sell, you know, things in quantity one or quantity five or ten and not a hundred thousand of something or a cement truck's worth of something would go. Um, so AliExpress is a, a cool place to go for um, basic electronics hobby components for cheap. So things like uh, an RC servo motor like we played with, you know, back in April. Right. Uh, let's say, you know, I want to buy uh, 200 of them. Now, they cost me less than a dollar a piece, $180 for, for 10 or five of them for $660 a piece plus $230 shipping, right? But you'll notice here on July 26th, estimated delivery is August 24th. These very literally ship by the slow boat, um, like they go on a container ship and, and ship slowly to the States. And that's why the shipping is so slow and also so cheap. Um, so if you're looking to really optimize on price, somewhere like AliExpress can be a, a really cheap place to shop. Um, let's see what an Arduino Uno uh, would cost us today. Something like $3.50, $4. Um, let's see if I can buy these in quantity. Let's see if I wanted to, to kit out a class um, with Arduino Unos. Let's say I wanted 10 pieces of them. So not so many results popping up. So for some objects, like they really only want to sell you the one um, and they won't only give you quantity discounts. Um, you could, of course, you know, up the quantity, but you might not get a price break on it. If you're looking to buy like, you know, a hundred Arduino Nanos, you might actually want to go over to Alibaba. Let's see if, uh, let's see if I search for Arduino Uno, Arduino Uno R3 and minimum order quantity is three, uh, but I could order up to a hundred thousand of them from this supplier. So, which is probably more than I want to you know, order for a, you know, for at least for this series of classes. But that's something that like uh, Alibaba might be more more in line with. Um, 
So, but AliExpress, I've ordered from AliExpress a bunch. In fact, some of the stuff I have kitted out here, I'm sure is from AliExpress. Oh, this was a cool little board. Um, this is a little um, RF amplifier board that I got. It's, well, it, it's green in real life, but on the camera today, it'll be blue, um, which uh, has like 20, 20 dB of amplification from one to 440 megahertz. So I was using this for a ham radio project. This whole little board cost me like six bucks. It took a month to get here, um, but it but it works pretty well. And it was, it was cheap and it came off the truck working and that's pretty fun. Um, things like little little serial driven segment seven segment displays these i know i got on aliexpress this was like a buck 70 for you know eight digits of display and a driver chip in the back that you can sort of spit serial data at and it will you know display a number at oh chris makes a good point sometimes the products from aliexpress do come faster than than you uh than they estimate there not always my experience is like on average maybe a week faster sometimes a couple days later sometimes like they'll come within a week, but you just, you kind of don't know. Um, you, you get what you pay for, I suppose, in that sense. Um, uh, oh, these guys also, um, these are little, uh, ESP8266 microcontrollers. Um, so that's a, a Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller with a USB port and some connectors on the back and all this good stuff. These were like, I think three bucks. And again, they took like three weeks to get here, but for a thing, I was like, oh, I want to, I want to play with that at some point. That seems fun. I'll order it on AliExpress, and then when it comes, I'll, that'll be the time that I play with it. Um, so for something that's in that vein, right, that's for a project that you might want to play around with someday, AliExpress is a cool place to look. Banggood is also a pretty decent supplier. They are slightly, slightly more consumer oriented, slightly less factory focused. So they, they you know, they will probably have similar products in the hobbyist vein, like Arduinos and Arduino kits and various things. Um, they might have a little less of the like modules and cables side of things, like the raw assemblies, but they have certainly think more things in the, like the RC and hobbyist electronics vein, and certainly more in the like tools, RC planes, RC bikes. You could buy an electric Bluetooth toothbrush on Banggood if you wanted to, whereas AliExpress might be a little bit harder to find. They do a little bit more curation on Banggood as well. Um, Palmer says, oh, Palmer says he ordered masks from Banggood on April 2nd and they were delivered this past Tuesday. That that sounds about right, right? You really do you really do take your chances on shipping some of this stuff. Um, and, and this, I guess, going back to your question earlier, Palmer, about like what is good to buy from where, you really, in most situations, you're you're getting what you pay for. Um, and for a, uh, to be like candid, like a lot of this hobbyist level stuff that's like it's fun, it's interesting. Uh, and if it, if it works pretty well, then I'm pretty happy. That is a, you know, ordering from AliExpress or Banggood is a pretty decent price point to be at. Um, when I was, uh, sorry, just looking up at my, my box of Arduinos there, because, uh, when I was starting the mini moving light project, I ordered, uh, a lot of 20 Arduino Pro minis for like 22 bucks. Um, knowing that there was a, you know, there was some chance that like none of them would work or be quite right. And there was a decent chance that like, you know, what I, what I've run into with those products specifically is that the power regulators on them are pretty crap um like they will burn out spontaneously if you try to pull you know even half of what they are nominally rated for there's some kind of off-brand power regulator and they go poof and smoke but for a project that like is going to be on my workbench and i don't really care if it goes up in smoke and i care but like I'll, you swap it out for another one that was another 80 cents and it's fine like that's a really decent price point for me for something that i care a little bit more about like a, a toothbrush i probably or, or a camera lens or even like screwdrivers and tools, I'd be a little bit more hesitant about. Um, but I would say, I would say all of the like hobby level electronics modules that I've bought off of Banggood and AliExpress have worked as well as I expected them to. Um, they worked with, they worked uh, better than their price would imply. I think that's a fair thing to say. Um, yeah. It's, it's, let's see. So Palmer says, going someplace like Adafruit, so you don't wonder if the question is, yeah. So yeah, so the get what you pay for rule is a good rule of thumb. And so the reasons to go to like Adafruit versus like a Banggood um, or an AliExpress, um, which, is, it, which is a totally valid question, right? It's like, do I, you know, here's a module on Adafruit that costs, you know, $17. Here's a thing that looks like it's this, basically the same thing for $7 uh, if I wait for a month. Like, which one should I get? Um, and there's a, there's a few answers there. Um, it does depend how reliable you want the thing to be and how confident you are given where you're at in a project that you're going to be able to know if it's the hardware that's screwing you, if it is, right? So 
Um, and that's actually, that's a good, this, this thing I'm holding is a good example, right? These things have a little, the, the clock line on these things is pretty picky. Um, and so it took me like a good half a day to figure out what was going on. And when I did, like, I, you know, there was like some jitter and like the displays weren't quite working. And then I figured out what it was by sort of poking at it with an oscilloscope. And then I got it working and they work great. Like they are totally reliable for what they are. They haven't, none of them have died yet that I have used, um, but they were a little bit finicky. And of course, like there's no, there's a basic pinout. There's no tutorial. There's hardly any schematic. Like it can be hard to be tell what's going on. Um, but for what I wanted to do with these, which was essentially play around with some like new microcontrollers, that was time I was happy to spend. Like it was a kind of a fun afternoon to, to play around in. If I was going to be putting these in like a, an industrial application or doing something for work or something, or if I wasn't confident that I would be able to diagnose that kind of problem, that really would have screwed me over. Whereas something like, just to take a, a practical example, um, a product I've actually used, um, something like these seven segment displays from Adafruit, um, a lot of which come with these really nifty backpack products. So you don't have to drive them directly. They act kind of like a shield. Um, let's find, let's see if I can find the actual product that I, I used once upon a time. I don't think I actually can. Oh, here, something like this. Um, so, so when I, I did a show at Looking Glass Theater long ago where we, I, I might have mentioned this last week or two weeks ago, um, replaced the digital clock on a, on a stove that was on the set with one of these modules so that we could change the time on the clock on the stove, right? And for that project, I, you know, this is not a hor it's 10 bucks. I think it was 15 bucks then. Not a horribly expensive project and it's for work so they can pay for it. But what I really wanted was like the reliability and like all of the diagrams and educational materials that come with this stuff. And that's something I guess I didn't, didn't super talk about when I, when we were talking about hobbyist suppliers is one of the big advantages of ordering through say Adafruit or SparkFun or Pololu is A, you know exactly what you're getting and B, they often come stocked with these great tutorials, right? So, you know, down at the bottom of this product page here, it leads me to this tutorial and I say, oh, cool. I ordered this seven segment backpack. It says, here's exactly how you hook it up. Um, here's how you would do the assembly. Here's how you would set it up with your Arduino and where each of the wires goes. Download this library and then include it. Like they really walk you through. They really want you to be successful because they know that like, it, you know, you, you want this thing to work and you, you, you probably are only, you might only be buying one of these to like to play around with and learn. And they don't want you to have that really frustrating experience of buying something that doesn't work. And that is a lot of what you're paying for when you're ordering from say Adafruit or SparkFun is you know what you're getting and they've, they've done a lot of the legwork for you. Um, so that's kind of a non-answer, I know, Palmer. Um, I whenever, whenever it's a product that I know I need to work or it's new enough to me that I'm not confident that I'm going to know what the oddities are or how to recognize them, I will go to an Adafruit, a SparkFun, or, you know, go to my local Micro Center and get the, you know, the, the near approximation. Micro Center actually also stocks Adafruit and SparkFun products, which is kind of cool. Um, so for something like a, a cheapy seven segment display that I just want to play around with, AliExpress, for something like, um, like I want to play with like putting a lipo charger on one of my products on um, projects and like doing some battery charge. I, this, this was, I, this is like six or seven years old now. I had never worked with lipo battery charging in this like circuit form factor directly hooked to my boards. So you can get this circuit board from overseas for I like pennies, I'm sure. Um, but I, I wasn't quite sure I, I was going to know what was going on. So I bought the real deal, right? I bought the spark fun board. It was like seven bucks. Um, and I, then when it, it, you know, it worked and I could see the schematic, they could download the schematic, I could download the parts. Um, and if I had problems, I could go on their forums and say, Hey, I bought this product and it's doing this thing. What should it be doing? So that's kind of what you're investing in. Um, when you buy a sort of a name brand product there. So I know that's not a, 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 a across the board answer that's useful and it will vary somewhat based on your product type. Um, for things like Arduinos specifically, really very common things, Arduino Unos, Pro Minis, Nanos, you can be pretty safe buying overseas um, because they are so prevalent and the designs are so widely distributed that even the clones are going to be pretty good. Specialty modules are where it gets squishy. Does that help, Palmer? I hope it does. I hope it does. 
Um, while Palmer's thinking about that, I want to share uh, one more little little side plug um, for a cool store. So on um, on AliExpress, really you're connecting to you know individual vendors who are selling you these things, right? You can search and find a product and buy it, but really you're buying a product from a specific vendor, right? These servos are coming from I'm not gonna try and pronounce it Ruijin Way store let's say, so sorry. Um, one cool store that is fun to check out is Ray Wu. I know at least a couple people out there have ordered from Ray Wu's store. Be fun if we looked at it in English, I imagine, because we're still in uh, Russian for some reason. Which probably means if you go to that big list of links that's that's linked below, it probably will take you to Russian AliExpress. So apologies for that. Um, Ray Wu sells a bunch of LED products that are super fun. Um, uh, NeoPixels, like we talked about earlier, NeoPixels inside, like, a Christmas light kind of form factor, right, where you can string up these and have individually controllable Christmas lights, um, uh, NeoPixels in tape form, controllers and waterproof cables and diffusion, um, we've ordered from Reiwu a lot, and I, I just like his line of products as a lighting nerd, so fun to look at, um, uh, on there and, and does good service. So um, when you start to find these, oh, you're, you're over here still. When you find these products that you're interested in on AliExpress, um, it's worth clicking through to see who the vendor is and see if they have other products that look um, look interesting and and fun because um, they often are are, are connected in a, in a similar shop, if you will. Um, let's see. Was there what else was there? Um, oh, the the only other category of things that I, I thought I would talk about tonight, and I'm sure there are. Um, there are lots of different examples of this are what I would call the warehouse suppliers. And I've linked some in the link list below all electronics, Goldmine, Elec, Jamico, right? These are, these are suppliers that don't really have a sort of a catalog catalog of um, a universal catalog of parts like DigiKey or a catalog of hobbyist specific parts like Adafruit or SparkFun. What they have is a big pile of stuff in a warehouse that they would like to sell you. So take this like BG micro, um, they will sell you, you know, Hey, we got some relays, come buy our relays. We might not have all the specs, but we got a bunch of relays and they're $2 a piece. Come buy our relays, right? Um, going to uh, Electronics Gold Mine, right? Uh, I'd like a um, an assembled Geiger counter tube for 55 bucks, limit one. I'd like to buy that, please. I'd like to buy a, a Borns rotary encoder. I'd like to buy a heater. And to, to be clear, like this stuff is usually not like... Uh, bad it's usually not off-brand it's just that they've you know they've acquired it surplus new old stock over the years or from a supplier and they they are not putting the same kind of legwork to specify spec out find data sheets as someone like a like a digi key or an adafruit will be but that means that their parts are often really really cheap um so if you just need like a bunch of get over there if you just need like a bunch of a thing um like you might want to play around with like just see like i might to play around with some lenses ah here's some traffic light lenses for five dollars a piece that's kind of fun or um you know i want to play around with uh some i mean you put an alarm on my product to make a big buzzer when something happens well you know you can buy a, an alarm module for like 12 bucks and throw it at something again you're not going to have the same level of documentation that you would have somewhere else but it's cheap so this can be kind of fun to, to, to troll around and be like, hey, what what weird things is this warehouse vendor selling these days? I like a glass vial of surface mount LEDs for 20 bucks, please. That's a fun birthday gift. Um, I like an Agilent camera, a VGA camera for a dollar with this weird connector on it that we're not going to tell you what that connector is. So you can figure it out yourself. But hey, it's a dollar, you know, stuff like that. So go check out the list of links um, if you if you want to see what some of those some of those suppliers are. I'm not going to go through them all just because that seems like a bit of overkill. Um but uh but yeah that's that those are a fun place to troll around they sort of have to play replace the like weird warehouse of stuff out in the world um i i definitely need a beer sip what uh what haven't we covered what were you like i wonder where jeff gets his x or his y or like where i could find a thing um now's a good time for questions my throat is, is killing me so it's, it's beer beer big beer sip o'clock Thought I would spare you the the burping sounds on stream. I usually don't finish the beers during the stream, but but this one is really good. That milk that milkshake IPA from Solomon Brewery, Rico and Sunny, very tasty. 
Um, yeah, that is so the the gist of like a of ordering parts for a project for me is once you've established the scope of what the project is, um, especially if it's a a new project, is to see if there's a first a module on Adafruit or Spark Fun that sort of does does what I want it to do. Like if you know when I wanted to integrate a GPS receiver into a project for the first time, I could go and buy you know a solder to a circuit board GPS receiver from DigiKey if I was feeling really brave. Or I could buy, you know, for 50% more, a really well-documented module from Adafruit um, that has, like, a library built for it and documentation, and they've tested it and know it works. That's probably the way I'm going to go. Um, Lady Ada, uh, who is who runs Adafruit, has gone on record and says, like, a lot of the products that they build, um, especially a lot of these, like, breakout boards, these sensor boards, are not, they're not terribly complicated products. And it's true. Like, let's take a, let's take a quick look. Like, let's go to... Adafruit, let's type Adafruit correctly. Um, let's go to like sensors as a good example. Um, how about a, uh, how about a humidity sensor? Something like, something like this. A sense, Sensirion, SHT31D temperature and humidity sensor, right? So that's a $14 product. I bet if we search the Sensirion and DigiKey, we would find... Oh, I still have it open. Um, Sensirion. Let's see if they're listed here. This is a thing I didn't plan to do beforehand, so we'll see if it bites me in the butt. But SHT31D. Let's try it. Sensirion, sht 31 d We'll see if they have exactly this part in stock. If we're very lucky, they will. Yeah, here we go. Humidity and moisture sensors, right? So, SHT31D. So I'm not 100% sure which variant this is, but it looks like in quantity one, it costs five or six bucks, right? Which means for DigiKey, who's ordering them by the hundreds, it probably costs, you know, three or four bucks, right? And they're charging you $14 for the product. Um, but really what you're paying for here is the fact that, like, they went out, found it, characterized it, put together a little circuit board. Like, you know, I, it cracks me up. I heard Lady Ada on a podcast once say, like, you know, laying out a little circuit board like this, you know, takes a couple hours, right? But the the labor that they put in is they make a tutorial for you. Here's, here's the digital temperature and, and sensor that we've already worked out. Here's exactly how you wire it up and some gotchas, right? There are different addresses you could hook it up to. Where the pins go to connect to your Arduino. Um, the Arduino code that makes it work and how you'd wire it up, right? That's what you're really paying for. It's not that like that the parts themselves are you know, this it's it's like uh the same way that like eating a hamburger at a restaurant is going to be more expensive than making that hamburger yourself. It's just going to be. But you can be pretty sure most of the time that like that that combination of like onion jam and bacon and blue cheese might sound a, might is that really going to work? Someone has tried it. Someone has tested it. You can be sure that what you're getting is going to be delicious and or electrically sound depending on which side of the metaphor you're in. So, especially if you're trying something for the first time, getting a module breakout board is really worth it. And then, if you decide it's a, a, a worthwhile project and you want to make 10 of them or 50 of them, maybe that's now that you've characterized that thing, now that's when you want to start start exploring less expensive options because you have a baseline to work from. That's just my philosophy of working with these things, but I, I think that's the way to sort of slice where to start sourcing projects from. If that makes sense. Cool. This was a lot more, this is more of a night than I thought it was going to be, um, which I guess <laughs> has been true of all of the nights uh, so far. <laughs> it's like, I, it's like this will be like 75 minute tops. We're, we're at two hours now, which frankly for, for this, uh, for Electronics Bash is still, is still pretty good. Um, so I feel okay about that. But I think, I think we'll start winding toward the, I, I have nothing more to say on electronic sourcing. Um, but if, any, if people do have more thoughts, feel free to share them. I guess I should double check that no one else submitted a link, but I think that was just the three that we saw. Yeah. Um, but to say about the next couple of weeks, um, just to lead into the next thing. So I mentioned at the beginning and I mentioned last week that we're going to start trending into Raspberry Pi related things. Um, so next week is going to be, we're, we're, if you think way back to, I think it was March 21st that we did Electronics Bash number one that was like, what is an Arduino? Next week is going to be, what is a Raspberry Pi? Like, we're going to start way back from the beginning. What what the heck is it? Why would I want one? What in broad terms can it do? 
what does it look like? Um, so we'll start with like a broad overview. And I think the, the week after that will be the, the setup portion. What do you, what do you need to plug into it? How do you put an operating system on it? Gotcha's there, like basic interactivity. So we're going to do like, you know, a, a broad strokes functionality, uh, and then get into sort of more technical details the next week. Um, and we're going to do this a little bit in comparison to like, you know, things you can do with an Arduino um, and things you can do with a Raspberry Pi, which there's a pretty broad spectrum of overlap between those two worlds, but they are also very different products at their heart. Um, let's see. Uh, Nate asked a very good question. Should I buy a Raspberry Pi to prepare? What part should I have to follow along? Um, if you want to, to follow along, um, I w so yes is the short answer. Um, if you want to like follow along with the, the ras the, with all of the Raspberry Pi stuff, you totally, you, 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 that would be the way to go. Um, a fair amount of what I propose to look at in the Raspberry Pi ecosystem is going to be based around writing code in Python. Um, so if you were, if you were looking not to purchase anything yet, which I totally understand, um, that would be programming in Python is something you can do, of course, on any PC, on your on your PC, on your Mac, on your Linux computer, what have you. So that's something you would not need to buy any products for. I, you know, what I should have done is, and what I will do for next week is find um, a minimal. Um, a minimal kit if you wanted to purchase all the kit components for a Raspberry Pi startup. Um, but I let's take we'll take a brief diversion and I'll show you sort of the the minimum amount that you would you would want to find. Um, this is drifting into next week's content just a little bit, um, but taking Adafruit for an example as a supplier. Although of course you could Spark Fun or Amazon or wh what have you. Um, there are a variety of um, types of Raspberry Pi. The most recent iteration of Raspberry Pi is the Raspberry Pi 4. So what I am going to be using for the demos is the Raspberry Pi 4. And I got the model. You get various various amounts of RAM. I got two gigabytes. One gigabyte, I'm sure, would be plenty um, for running everything that's not like super processor intensive. Um, so that's like the basic version. You also want to get a decent power supply. So I, I literally ordered my kit from, from Adafruit this past week just to have a fresh kit to start with. Um, you can all, you can get the official Raspberry Pi power supply, the three, the three amp USB-C power supply from Adafruit if you want to or not. Um, if price is a real consideration and it being what, what day of the year it is, I totally understand that. Um, you can do all of these same demos with uh, the various Raspberry Pi Zero products. So this is, uh, let's see, actually, hang on, bear with me a little tummy cam. Um, I'm gonna pull my actual full-size Raspberry Pi out of the 3D printer, because it's not actually doing anything at the moment. All right, so that's that's a full-size Raspberry Pi. And again, it's really green on the camera, it's blue. Um, so that's a full-size Raspberry Pi. The Pi Zero are this sort of smaller form factor. You really don't lose any functionality. What you lose is connectivity, right? So you can see like the full-size Raspberry Pi has four USB ports, an ethernet jack, a full-size HDMI port, although I think the modern ones have a micro HDMI um, and a headphone jack. Whereas the uh, the mini, the, the, the Raspberry Pi Zeros um, have a, this one has a mini HDMI port, um, USB micro for power, but you don't have any direct connectivity built in. I think this is actually probably one of these is, so you could, you'd have to, you know, put in a, uh, a USB hub if you wanted full size USB ports, you'd have to do a USB to ethernet adapter if you wanted hardline ethernet um, and things like that. So these have some advantages in terms of connectivity that I think makes them easier to work with. Um, but as far as like pure cost, these will be less. The Zero W model, um, which I think is $10, um, has Wi-Fi built into it. Um, so if you didn't want to, you know, connect hardline to Ethernet, you could get the Zero W model, a power supply, and a mini or micro USB to full-size USB to plug into a monitor. Um, you will also need a micro SD card for either of these versions. That actually is what sort of holds the operating system and, and is the hard drive for these mini computers. Um, so depending on how much of that you already have in house, there can be a, a little bit of cost to getting started with these. Um, but you may also already have, you know, uh, this is a, I think a 16 gig micro SD. I think you, an eight would be plenty, which are like five bucks these days. Um, if you had to choose which of these components to prioritize in terms of quality and reliability, the power supply is actually worth getting a decent one. Um, 
so like I, for example i'm running this guy i'm uh, running my 3d printer right now on this and i have like an old janky one amp amp and a half power supply on um and it it's not great it, it sometimes dies it throws me errors it, it's underpowered so buying you know the eight dollar full-size power supply is actually worth it in this case um all this to say so so next week's session specifically um is going to be overview introductory what can you do with it what is it in broad strokes without getting into the technical setup <laughs> honestly specifically to buy me a little more time to come up with specific recommendations uh, about product lines like this um but i i think what i would will say next sunday is essentially what i just said any of the raspberry pis will work you may need a few accessories you will need an sd card and i recommend a decent power supply um uh, and everything beyond that is sort of a matter of how much connectivity is is useful to you. Um, yeah, does that sort of help, Nate? I, I I I did sort of sort of throw this throw this into the wind, and I also I I, I totally understand that like we are all and me included are trying to be very price conscious these days. Um, so we'll we'll try and try and keep it minimal, um, and that's partly why also like I think some of the things we will learn to do on the Raspberry Pi um, will be things that we've already seen how to do on the Arduino, and we'll learn how to do them in the context of. Um, of Raspberry Pi, like, you know, have an internet connected thing that can blink an LED um, or um, have a button that tweets. Because, of course, now that we have like internet connections, um, we can do like more integrated, integrated things with well, internet connections, HDMI connections, like there's it opens up a whole new world for us. So. Um, so, yeah, that I think is the plan. Um, I'm going to try and keep the evenings a little bit shorter than the historical, like, 2.45 that they have been, um, just because I am back at work uh, now, and the, the time is a little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, limited and precious, but I, I think we'll still have a really great time. Um, ooh, Chris, good point. Seeing the same programs between the two would be nice than jumping to more advanced. Yeah, sure. So we'll, we'll spend, I think next week will be like, you know, what is a Raspberry Pi? We'll talk about setup because it is a little bit more involved, right? This was the great thing about the Arduino, right? Is it's, it's very plug and play. Raspberry Pi is, is, is very user friendly, but there are some more steps to getting it sort of up and working. Um, and then, yeah, we'll move on to a few things like, you know, we start where we started with all the Arduino stuff, like blink an LED, read from a switch, um, that kind of basic functionality. Um, and w w through that, we'll build some like some functionality around um, learning to use uh, Circuit Python uh, to, to to build that code. And we'll very quickly, I think, actually get into some like some new stuff that we couldn't really do in the context of Arduino, like um, you know, a more easy way to say to type in the user types in the brightness of an LED, set it to that brightness. Um, and it's like the user, you know, when the user tender enters input, play some sound. Um, when, uh, when the user, uh, you know, download a file from the internet and if certain conditions turn an LED on that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> no worries, Chris. Yeah. I think, I think spacing out the, the weeks a little bit more will be helpful to me. It might be helpful for y'all because I know three hours of uh, internet registers I know was like everyone's favorite, like the most awake everyone's been. Um, but I, I, I need to pare back on three hours of internet registers for the future. <laughs> All right, y'all, let's wrap it up for the night. This has been a great Sunday night. It's really... Um, it's really been great to come back here on a Sunday night and, uh, and see all these friendly faces and, and share some more things again. And honestly, it's been a good excuse to clear off my workbench because I have so much so much stuff sitting around here. It's been fun to share it off. Um, as always, thank you for joining us on these Sunday nights. It is such a privilege to be here with you. I hope it is giving you strength to go out and do good things in the world just like it is giving to me. Um, I, I really do appreciate it and I love sharing this time with you. Um, I hope you are staying safe. I hope you are hydrating. I hope you are washing your hands and wearing a mask. Um, and uh, as always, if you have questions, comments, issues, concerns you can leave a comment on this video or find me on twitter at jeffers glass more information about next week's stream will be posted here on this youtube channel so smash that like button and subscribe <laughs> i couldn't resist uh <laughs> or on the website jeff.glass slash electronics bash i've been jeff glass y'all are great and i will see you next week thanks everybody <laughs> bye